So, okay. So, again, we will, uh, ulitin ko pong house rules. Be on time. Mute your mic. Q&A after each talk. And listen attentively and have fun learning. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our first speaker for this more uh, afternoon or lecture for this afternoon. Um, he graduated his BS degree at Vis Visaya State University by Bailete in 1986 with a major of soil science. And he had his MS at University of the Philippines, Los Banos in 1994 uh, as mm -hmm. Environmental Studies for Development Communication and his PhD units in the same university uh, for the Environmental Science and Development Communication. Currently, he is a professor of Cavite State University. Ayun, nagtuturo po talaga siya. Uh, teacher or professor nila, sir. Sir, ano yan? Sir Brian and Sir Mar Marco Felix. Yan. So let's welcome Sir Noel, our Prof. Noel Sedigo. Hi, Sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Po. Thank you, Renz. Marinig nyo ako. Mi sounds, ha? Yes, you can po. hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I just would like to extend my, my greetings muna sa lahat sa Padayon. Padayon is ako'y Bisaya eh, kaya alam ko na ibig sabihin ng Padayon. And at UPLB, that's a very active group ano, ng mga student uh, leaders or student org din sa UP Los Banos. Okay. Uh, without further ado, sayang kasi yung oras. What I'm going to share this afternoon would be snapshots only of soil survey and classification. I cannot condense everything uh, in one uh, setting, but I hope to finish it. I think I have 58 slides. I hope to do that uh, quickly. Alam ko naman kayo ay mga BSA and uh, soil science yung iba, so it's going to be understandable to everyone. Yung mga term. Anyway, if you have questions later, you can throw some questions later sa akin. Hindi naman ako nagtataksil. Ako yung BSA agriculture, major in soil science, but I shifted to environmental science at UPLB. So, uh, napakaganda na I experience at ang soil science ay nagiging foundation ko sa environmental science. And uh, it remains to be in my heart. Kaya ko ano yung i-share ko ngayon sa inyo, ayun yung usually yung sinishare ko din sa Cavite State University sa aming BSA. Ako yung nagre-review also for them sa kanilang board exam and so far so good parang nakapasa naman lahat maganda performance ng Cavite State University so thank you for inviting me Oops, can we share now uh, share lang na yung slide eh. ayo yan Okay. Um, sinisure lang na mag-move siya. Ha? Check ko lang. Uh, Na-view nyo na, Renz? Wala kang sound. Yes right? po, sir. Okay. Sige. So this is this is uh, very basic, ano? Uh, very basic discussion of soil survey or soil classification actually. So this is all about soil taxonomy because soil survey naman is more of taxonomy. And this is related, just similar to sa biological sciences. And when you talk of soil taxonomy, you're talking of how you classify soils and how you give it names. So by definition, soil taxonomy refers to the system of classification developed by the US uh, DA Soil Survey. So ito ay para ding pag magbigay tayo ng scientific name sa mga living organisms, 
same style sa USDA nga lang siya dinevelop na sila yung experts kasi sa soils talaga. Uh, so, we talk of individual soils and ito yung mga terms that you normally encounter. Uh, yung iba sa inyo, familiar na ito. Like a pedon. So, a pedon is, a, is an hexagonal column of soil measuring from pwedeng 1 square meter to up to 10 square meters on the top surface area. So a pedon is the basic sampling unit used in soil survey. Kung, kung sa, sa biology ito, cell ang pinag-usapan, pag sa soil naman, we talk about pedon. Now, a, a, a collection of pedons, kapag marami ka ng pedons na pinag-join, we call it polypedon. So an, a polypedon is an essential soil individual comprising of an identifiable series of soils in an area. So it is made up of multiple pedons na and has distinctive characteristics that differentiate it from surrounding polypedons. Usually, hindi naman pwede ma-identify ang isang soil sa soil survey or sa classification by using only a pedon, isang unit lang. Usually, you have a series of pedons that you're going to describe and to determine kung yung area na yon belongs to one soil individual or one uh, example soil series in this case. So you have the pedon, then you have polypedons, then you have a series. So a soil series is a class of soils and a basic unit used to classify a soil. So nearly there are 400 soil series in the Philippines. I don't know kung yung latest ay nadagdagan na siya, pero so far, yun yung on record. 400 siya. So, paano, paano na, na reach yung mga series na yun, etc. Again, kung ang pedon ay unit of study na ginagamit sa soil survey, so, bawat pedon, describe physically yung kanyang mga horizons at saka yung characteristics ng soil. And then, meron kasing mga the same observation lang na nakuha mo from one pedon to another. So a collection of pare-parehong mga pedons, you call it a polypedon, would tell you if yung soil na dinescribe sa buong area na pwedeng you're talking of square kilometers or hectares is a series. So basically, sa classification, sa soil survey, it's the soil so series which is the basic unit used to classify soils. So let's look at, ito yung sinasabi kong soil individual. So soil individual would be a polypedon, a collection of different pedons in an area. Now, meron mga terms dito na pinakita. Uh, I think you're familiar with horizons of the soil, soil profile. You have A1, A2, B, C, R. So you know na ang, ang A ay mga surface horizons siya. Ang B ay mga subsoil or subhorizon. Ang C is parent material. And then your R is your bedrock. Now, usually, so soil survey and classification, we look at the control section of the soil profile when we try to describe this one. And the control section actually is just 30 to halos 90 centimeters in depth from the surface. Although, kino consider din naman ang A1 o yung ating uh, uh, surface soil. But karamihan sa mga parameters used to describe a soil would look at the 30 to 90 uh, centimeters na depth. Uh, you know what soil solum is. Soil solum is uh, we call true soil. So that is from the A horizon or the, the uppermost surface horizon, in this case A1, up to the B horizon or where you start the transition between B and C. So ang C naman ay parent material, so hindi siya classified as soil. So that soil solum, and you know now the control section for a soil pedon. And that's how we study a soil. And uh, that's these, these um, parameters, these concepts are used to describe a soil. And so every, every pedon will be described using these um, concepts. And then yung mga properties na nakukuha doon, those are the ones that are used to classify soils uh, kaagad. So 
Ang principles of soil taxonomy are simple lang naman. Number one, we classify soils on the basis of its properties. And karamihan ng properties na tinitingnan are usually physical chemical properties or physical properties, particularly uh, moisture and pH and kanyang texture. Halos yun lang ang tinitingnan. Then soil properties should be readily observable and or measurable kasi kailangan tangible yung, yung mga parameters na gagamitin. Soil properties should either affect soil genesis or result from soil genesis. Now, there are soils, alam nyo naman na there are soils that are transported, hindi na siya originally na develop on site. So, usually, sa soil survey and classification, we classify soils that are originally developed sa kanyang site. So, ibig sabihin, for millions of years, galing talaga siya sa parent material or sa bedrock sa ilalim. Yung mga soil karamihan na na-transport like either artificially by human um, activities ay natambakan yung area or by flooding or by, um, alam nyo na, transport uh, sa water ay nag-iba yung mga soil. So ito ay consider lahat. So soil genesis would be looked at very well when we try to classify soils. So the purpose of soil taxonomy, ano talaga ang purpose niya? Number one, para din yung sa scientific uh, names ng mga organisms, we look at the soil in order to organize or we look uh, we use taxonomy in order to organize our knowledge about soils. Kasi there are soils that are similar, there are soils that are different, so we need also to organize in soil science. And we need to understand relationships among different soils. So how would one series differ from each other? And all these have implications for farm management. Um, so in taxonomy, we establish groups or classes Basically, for practical purposes, kasi hindi naman all the time, uh, you need to test your soil. Uh, maganda na yung meron ka ng initial idea that these types of soils, ay either, either they are fertile or not fertile, they're productive or not productive, or droughty ba siya or flooded siya. And you can establish it using soil taxonomy. So we look at predicting behaviors So this uh, uh, we, we look at the soil, use taxonomy to predict behavior of the soil, to identify kung ano ang best use ng soil, which is ito talaga yon yung, yung purpose ng soil survey. Estimating productivity, yun yung sinasabi ko kanina, na we can, we can say whether the soil is productive or not, and we can also estimate its fertility, kung siya fertile or not. Mga estimations. And then, of course, extending research results, kung merong mga studies, and uh, very important on soil taxonomy when it comes to studies or researches in crop So what are the requirements? Now, ito, I, I just, kung, kung hindi soil taxonomy and, or soil survey and classification ng inyong mga expertise, there are requirements para maintindihan ang soil survey and classification. The, the first one is all about temperature, or we call it temperature regimes. So temperature regimes means the mean annual soil temperature measured at the soil control portion, you know, 50 centimeters from the surface. So normally, we have a soil hydrometer that can monitor the temperature of the soil, and you get the, the annual soil temperature or the mean soil temperature. And from that, we base yung classification of soil using temperature regimes. Then meron ding tinatawag na moisture regimes. Moisture regimes are the number of days when soil contains water, available water, and kalagay eh, available water. Kasi remember, ang soil water ay eh, merong not available, merong readily available, meron ding flood water. So we're talking here of number of days when soil contains available water during the period when soil temperature at 50 centimeters below the surface is above freezing or above 5 degrees centigrade. So remember, um, soil taxonomy came from 
the US at saka European countries. So we're talking here of about even freezing temperatures sa soil. Although sa atin, sa tropical regions, we have naman as high as 22 degrees centigrade for soil temperatures. So again, temperature regimes. Second, moisture or water regimes. Then we talk of diagnostic horizons. These are distinct types of horizons that reflect the nature of soil formation. Na kaya tinawag siyang diagnostic because these are the soil horizons that we're going to describe and talk about in order to classify a soil through soil taxonomy. So merong tinatawag na epipedon. Technically, we call it epipedon. Epi meaning surface. So it's just surface diagnostic horizons. Then we have also subsurface diagnostic horizons. So yung subsurface, you usually, these are your B horizons or yung mga subsoils. Then there is mineralogy or the dominant type of clay minerals that are found in the soil. Remember, there are different, alam nyo naman yan, there are different types of clays or clay minerals. And these are used in soil taxonomy to determine your characteristic ng soil. And the last but not the least, ang pinaka-importante na physical uh, trait ng soil is particle size distribution or ito yung, ano, ito yung texture ng ating soil. This is just the proportion of your, your sand, your silt, and your clay in your soil. So simply said, ang particle size distribution is just actually whether it is sandy or clay or silty. And merong 12, di ba? Textural classification. So again, ito yung five that are used as requirements for soil taxonomy, temperature, moisture, diagnostic horizons, mineralogy, and particle size distribution. We look at closer soil temperature regimes. Again, these are measured at 50 centimeters from the ground surface. Dito papasok yung mga terms sa soil taxonomy. Ano? Uh, the first one is kapag ang mean, again, mean annual temperature is less than zero degrees centigrade. Ito yung mga nasa freezing, below freezing uh, na mga areas. We call it pergelic, ang tawag pergelic. Now, kapag zero degree centigrade naman, hanggang eight degree centigrade ang mean annual temperature ng isang soil, so at least higher na ito, almost, uh, above freezing, we call it cryic, ano, cryic in uh, soil taxonomy. Then the frigid is kapag ang mean annual temperature ay less than eight degree centigrade, but if you will notice, Di, pag sinabi kasing less than 8 degrees centigrade, di para na rin siyang pergelic sana. But merong, merong catch ito because it is warmer than cryic in summer. So ibig sabihin, kasi soil temperatures can vary from, from during sa winter season at saka sa summer season. So kapag the, the, it's warmer during summer, we, we usually classify it as frigid. Mesic is if the mean annual temperature is higher this time, 8 degrees hanggang 15 degrees centigrade. Uh, we call it mesic. And then E, thermic, that is kapag ang temperature mo ay 15 degrees centigrade hanggang 22 degrees centigrade. Now, if you will notice, ang thermic, ito na yung sa atin dito sa Pilipinas or sa mga tropical countries. Karamihan ng soil natin dito ay nandito sa soil temperature regimes na thermic. So we don't expect pergelic here or cryic or frigid. Baka mesic meron pa pero bihira nga. Usually what we have ay thermic. Ngayon meron pang ang hyperthermic which is common sa lalo sa ating Visayas area hanggang Mindanao. Ito yung mga greater than 22 degrees centigrade. Kaya maririnig nyo yan sa atin sa Pilipinas na mga pangalan ng mga soil ay isohyperthermic, hyperthermic karamihan. So again, ang common sa atin ay thermic or hyperthermic. In fact, uh, bihira din ako maka-encounter pa ng <clears throat> thermic. Karamihan na nakikita ako talaga sa Pilipinas ay hyperthermic. Okay. 
So ito yung, sorry, yun yung mga soil temperature regime. So madali naman tandaan yung mga names. So, gagamitin yan later scientific name ng soil. So per jelly, cryic, frigid, mesic, thermic, and hyperthermic. Now we look at soil temperature regimes I also. Ito, this one, yung ISO, ay ginagamit sa classification if ang, var ang variation, kasi sa US nga siya dinevelop, ay between summer and winter time. So sa kanila, yung summer ay June, July, August. Tapos yung winter time sa kanila ay December, January, February. Kapag ang temperature down nila nag-differ ay less than 5 degrees centigrade, that's, that's the time na gagamitin ang prefix na ISO sa soil classification. Uh, tandaan nyo lang to yung word na ISO. But bihira ito sa Pilipinas kasi again, we don't have winter and we don't have a, a summers. Actually, what we have is only dry and wet season. So, ayan, tingnan nyo, nilagay siya. ISO frigid. Kapag balikan mo yung frigid, so alam mo na balikan natin ng kaunti, ang frigid ay less than 8 degrees centigrade ang temperature niya, pero warm siya during summer. Kaya pag lalagyan ng ISO, ibig sabihin ang mean summer temperature o ang difference niya would differ only by five, less than 5 degrees centigrade. Kung isomesic, ganun din. Kung isothermic, ganun din ang variation ng anak iiba and isohyperthermic. Itong isohyperthermic ang karamihan na nakikita ko sa Philippines. So again, ang variation dito ay napaka-liit lang. So that's less than 5 degrees centigrade. So that's the time you use the word or the prefix iso sa classification. Now we look at soil moisture regimes. So soil moisture is measured in terms of the absence or presence of water held at a tension of less than 15 bars in the moisture control section by a period of one year. Pag less than 15 bars, so this, are, this is available water, and yun yung nami-measure uh, up to sa control, moisture control section, so that's 50 centimeters below the surface, then you determine yung moisture niya, levels ng soil, by a period of one year. So sa soil moisture control section, that's 10 to 30 centimeters for clay soils, 20 to 60 centimeters for loamy soils, and 30 to 90 kapag sandy soil. So that's just how we measure it uh, para hindi magkamali ano, when we classify soil moisture region. So we look, we look at soil moisture regime na ginagamit soil taxonomy. It's the same with the temperature. Merong mga pangalan. So, can you close lang yung door? So the first one, I, we call it aquic moisture regime. Here, the soil is saturated and no dissolved oxygen or reducing, re, uh, ang tawag reducing regime kasi no dissolved oxygen na matest mo sa moisture or sa water and uh, relatively saturated yung soil. Yun yung idea. Kaya the word is aquic. Pag aritic and toric, these are soil moisture control section that are dry more than half of the time when soil temperature at 50 centimeters is greater than 5 degrees centigrade. And it's usually moist for Less than three months only. So yun yung mga aridic from the word arid. Aridic, so relatively dry. And toric. Mi ustic moisture regimes. These are soils sa control section that are dry for more than three months and continuously moist for at least three months. So more or less, um, uh, pag sinabing dry for more than three months ay halos halos for a long time siya dry pero may continuity or meron namang moist for almost 3 months then so you call it eustic mo or ustic moisture regime me eudic moisture regime pag eudic the soil is dry for less than 3 months only then me seric moisture regime 
the soil is continuously dry for 45 days after summer and continuously moist for 45 days after winter. Ito yung dry summer or wet winter. Ito yung mga extreme na conditions. Again, sa atin sa Philippines, uh, wala ka namang makitang ganito because we only have dry and moist. So karamihan sa atin ay nasa aquatic moisture regime or aridic and toric minsan. Pero karamihan nakikita ko talaga is aquatic moisture sa atin. Kasi usually wet talaga yung ating soil. So, okay? So, after knowing, balikan ko lang kaunti, after knowing yung temperature regimes, ano yung mga terminologies na ginamit like pergelic, cryo, frigid, mesic, thermic, and hyperthermic. And then, gagamitin yung word na ISO if kailangan. Then, nalaman natin ang soil moisture regime as either aquic, aridic and toric, eustic, eudic, and syric. We now look at okay, the diagnostic horizon. So, pag diagnostic horizons, we're talking of surface horizons, the epipedon, and the subsurface horizons. Ngayon, meron na yung mga terms siya at meron mga descriptions sa bawat isa like molic, umbric, histic, and octric. And then, ang subsurface, ay meron na din argilic, natric, that's, uh, spodic, oxic, cambic, or totally wala siya. So let's look at yung mga description nitong mga uh, epipedons muna or yung surface horizons. So molic epipedon, for instance, ay established na siya. Na siya ay thick, dark, soft surface layers. And from the word molisol kasi, so ito, ito yung marami actually ang organic matter, kaya siya dark, tapos siya soft. Pero if you will notice, thick siya. Kaya karamihan ng mga molic epipedon ay makikita mo yan sa mga, mga soils na undisturbed or yung iba nasa forest talaga because or sa mountainous areas dahil hindi sila nadidisturb. So ito mga characteristics niya, pag sinabing thick, talagang greater than 10 inches yung kapal. Tapos high base saturation or more than 50%. It's a mineral soil, hindi siya organic soil. Soils form under prairie vegetation. Kasi nga sa US nga ang, ang terminology na ginamit. So they talk of prairie. Sa atin naman, we talk of grasses or grasslands. Ano? So makikita nyo itong molik sa grassy areas where usually mountainous undisturbed. For umbric, like more Katulad siya sa molik yung description, uh, uh, thick and then uh, dark, ang kaibahan ay sa base saturation. So kanina ay high base saturation, 50%. Ito ngayon, low base saturation. So yun lang ang kaibahan niya. Pag histic naman, ito yung mga organic soil. So alam niyo naman yung histosol, histic, organic soils. And usually, they are submerged in water, eh, kaya nga naging organic soils kasi mga vegetation yun or mga grasses na nababad sa tubig, sa flood water for a long time. So nagiging organic. So they are saturated with water and high percent organic matter, kaya histic. Gano ka high? Usually 20% pataas. Ocric are thin, light-colored surface soil that do not fit any of the above. So ito lang minsan soil taxonomy. Ano? Ocric siya, pag siya thin, light color. The rest kasi, eh, puro dark yung mga yan. Eh, yung nasa unahan. So, when we try to compare, ito yung framework sa soil taxonomy, kung paano. Uh, usually, we look at uh, things, ang pinaka-basis ay ang molik. And kapag ang molik lang ay lighter colored, so, so pag sukat niyo, for instance, sa surface soil, ay parang siyang molik kasi dark, etc. Pero lighter ang colored, tapos manipis lang naman. So we rather call it ocric sa classification. Pag mataas ang kanyang organic matter, siya thick, dark, pero mataas ang percent organic matter, we classify it as histic. Ano nga yung mataas? 20% pataas yung kanyang organic matter. 
Tapos, kapag siya parang molik, pero dark at low ang kanyang base saturation. So without doubt, siya ay ombre. So ganyan gumamit nitong uh, framework na to sa comparison ng epipedons. Pag pumunta naman tayo sa subsurface horizon, so ito yung sa, sa lower, below horizon, mga B uh, horizon, Argilic. Ano bang argilic? These are alluvial horizon of clay accumulation. If you will notice, BT horizons or clay accumulation. Kung familiar kayo sa classification ng mga horizons, kapag merong clay accumulation, automatic alam ka, tawagin ka agad na BT. Argilic horizons ito. Alluvial kasi merong accumulation ng mga clay. Natric naman is same with argilic but Unusually, mataas ang kanyang sodium content. So 15% or more ang kanyang exchangeable sodium pag-test niya sa laboratory. So tinawag na natric. And uh, ito mga structures na pinakita sa sample sa color. So not necessarily columnar, pero because of the presence of sodium, ito ang na-observe sa karamihan sa natric horizons. Nakita niyo yung parang mga columns or columnar na structure. Sa itaas naman, yung sa clay usually uh, very sticky tapos maraming bilog-bilog na accumulate. So yeah, those are just physical indications. Pero ang pinaka-importante ng mga parameters ay clay for argilic and for nitric it is sodium. Pag spodic, these are alluvial accumulation of oxides of aluminum and iron naman or ang tawag natin ay Sesky oxides, di ba? Kapag alu aluminum and iron. And organic matter. So it is red or dark red color only found in acid sandy soils. Makita nyo talaga, only found in acid sandy soils with high rainfall, generally found below the E horizon and contains a BHS or BS horizon for... Um, Typical soil. So ang spodic, hindi yan mapaggamalan. Very clear yan sa acid sandy soil. So sa experts sa classification, by, by getting information sa acidity ng soil and location ng horizon, kagad-agad may idea na siya kung ano ang itatawa. For oxic, the term oxic, talagang ang tinutukoy ay highly weathered layers of soils, very weathered soils, usually only and iron and aluminum oxides and one is to one clay minerals. Now, low pH or acidic siya, not very fertile. Ito yung mga red soils na nakikita sa atin sa Laguna, maraming ganito, uh, particularly sa Lukban, nakikita ko to. So mga red soils, because of the dominance of iron and um, aluminum oxide. So karamihan ng tropical soils, tandaan nyo, are oxic. Now remember, these are highly weathered, tapos dominated ba pa ng iron and aluminum, kaya tapos one is to one pa na clay. So alam mo na, na acidic soil ito. So relatively low ang pH and usually not very fertile. Kaya minsan, yun na nga yung argument namin ng mga soil scientists na hindi totoo na yung soil natin sa tropical region are very fertile. Na it's because of that, yun ang dominant characteristics niya for highly weathered soils. That's oxic. Cambic are slightly altered layers, not weathered enough to be argelic. BW horizon designation or development of color or structure. So ito namang kambik, uh, these are fallback uh, or default ng mga argelic horizons sa itaas. And uh, pag, pag usually, tulad yan, ang kanyang designation na kita nyo sa figure ay AP. Pag AP ay yun yung plow layer. So alam niyo yung horizon na yan, nasa uh, plow layer na sa itaas. So sure ka na slightly altered itong mga soils na to. And we call it cambic. Kung nan, yun yung walang makikitang diagnostic subsurface horizons present. So are there soils na walang subsurface horizons? Yes, merong mga soil na ganun. Okay, hindi pa na-develop. So again, ha, very quickly, yung mga terms are gelic, Natric, 
spodic, oxic, cambic, or none. Ang oxic, common sa atin sa Philippines, kaya yun yung papasok sa utak natin kaagad. For swords. So how do you compare? The same framework ang ginamit namin pag uh, sa subsurface rises, katulad sa epipedons. So yung argelic, siya ang pinaka-basic. Ano? So kapag less developed ang soil, makita nyo, so kagad-agad we classify it as cambic. Kapag para siyang argelic pero mataas ang sodium, we call it natric. Kapag marami siyang aluminum and iron and therefore expected mata, mababa ang pH or acidic, siya ay spodic. Pag highly weathered siya, so we call it oxic. So yun ang paggamit ng mga frameworks na yan. So in soil taxonomy, soils are divided into six distinct categories based on diagnostic, diagnostic horizons or characteristics. So ito, ito, if you will notice, ito yung typical na name ng isang soil. Fine, loamy, mixed, comma, mesic, aquic, archaeodols. Now if you will, if you're going to look at it, uh, actually sa board exam, lumalabas yung mga ganito. Uh, Madali yung fine, loamy, mixed. So, ibig sabihin, loamy yung kanyang texture. Pero, dyan pumapasok yung kanyang pangalan, yung mesic. Can you recall? Ko ano yung mesic? Ano yan? Yun yung sa temperature, remember? Tapos yung aquic, di ba yun yung sa moisture? And then you have RG or argelic. That's talking of subsurface horizons. So more or less, I hope at this point, I may idea na kayo na usually, ito yung mga pangalan ng soil, sa yung scientific terms. Pero sa soil taxonomy kasi, ay merong orders, suborders, great groups, subgroups, family, and series. The series, again, is the basic. Basic, ha? Pinakababa na subunit of classification. Start tayo sa series, ano pataas. Sa series, we're talking here of the parent material, the kind, the number, and arrangement of horizons in the profile. If you will notice, sa series talaga, very specific sa soil genesis ang pinag-uusapan. Parent material eh. So hindi usually, ang mga transported soils usually ay mahirap i-classify. So we talk of on-site development of soils to classify that soils into series. So parent material ang tinutungtingnan. Again, uh, arrangement ng horizon sa soil profile, very specific sa pedon, ano, yung sa soil profile mismo. When you go up sa family, here you're talking of particle size. Particle size is all about texture already, soil texture. Tapos, idagdag mo na si mineralogy, yun yung sa clay, okay? or clay or silk, anong meron na minerals. Then, ipasok mo na ang temperature regimes, tapos, pwede na ang moisture regimes. So, sa family, that's higher, pero mas specific pa din. The family and the series are the lowest sa classification. But usually, the names of the soil gets from the series. Para bang genus at saka species. Ang species ay series sa soil. Ang genus ay ang family. Then we go higher sa so number four, we call it subgroups. These are typic or central concept, the great groups, integrates or transitional forms to other orders, suborders or great groups, extra grades or additional properties not common to great group characteristics. Actually, subgroups I born out of great groups. So ano ang great groups? Great groups are subdivide, suborders based on differences between soil horizons. Uh, ito, hindi masyado na-appreciate ng hindi mga expert talaga sa soil taxonomy, but yung experts sa soil taxonomy alam na great groups can be subdivided into subgroups. Uh, yun yung merong-merong um, methodology or mas, mas deeper na pag-aaral doon. And then, next to the highest level na yung suborders, these are subdivides or subsoil order based on moisture and temperature. Ayan, general na siya, moisture and temperature. And then, ang highest are ang soil orders, which, are, which is 
ang pinagbasihan ay presence or absence of diagnostic horizons. Now remember, ang pinag-usapan sa order are just presence or absence of diagnostic horizons. Sa baba, sa series, ang pinag-usapan talaga ay parent material. So sa orders pa lang, kung order lang naman ang, ang iyong interest, by just looking at the soil profile, kung meron sa yung diagnostic horizons, you would have idea already kung paano i-classify ang isang soil based on orders. Okay? So, yung nasa itaas na example, yung fine, low, mean, mixed, mesic, up, quick, RGU dolls later, ay ating himay-himayin po nung itsura niya. Ano? Ito yun eh, kung saan yung family, saan yung subgroup, saan yung great groups, saan yung suborders, and then yung orders mismo. Uh, okay. Yung sa orders, hindi um, ko pa nabanggit kanina, meron naman talagang established soil order sa pinagbasihan. And how it is written, ito yung buong pangalan ng soil in soil taxonomy. So fine, loamy, mixed, super active, mesic. Now remember the word mesic. Aquic, so that is submerged in water, saturated. RG from argilic. You dolls, and you will know that when we talk about orders. So, mama, yung balikan natin si Guru yun. So, based on soil properties that affect management and root penetration, such as texture, temperature, and depth. Ngayon sa parang kung naman sa board exam or I think sa experience nilang kumuha sa board exam, hindi naman kayo pinapagawa ng scientific name ng soil or give a taxonomic name ng soil. Pero ibibigay yung ganito. And then, from there, magtatanong siguro sa multiple choice, what is the characteristic of this soil? See, uh, dito, makukuha mo na. Sa family pa lang, you would know na the texture of the soil. The soil texture, fine loamy. So loamy, loamy is typical sa ideal soil, sa loam. Clay minerals, Mixed. So, ibig sabihin, combination siya ng iba-iba. One is one, two is one, etc. Iba-ibang clay minerals so hindi man distinguish kung alin ang dominant. Cation exchange capacity or CEC, nakikita na, na may measure dyan. Temperature, malalaman na. Sorry, bakit may CEC? Because ang clay minerals would give you an idea kung mataas o mababa ang cation exchange capacity. Tapos, ito na yung pinaka-importante. Kasi kung, kung um, um, sa inyong mga discussion sa knowledge nyo about physical and chemical properties of the soil, remember the CEC is an indicator of soil fertility. Kapag mataas ang cation exchange capacity, you have a very good idea that the soil may be fertile. Kapag mababa ang CEC, you have an idea that the soil may be poor or not fertile or less fertile. So given yung clay minerals, we can easily deduce na ay mababa ang CEC nito and therefore mababa din ang fertility niya. Tapos meron ka pang texture, malalaman mo kung ang soil is good for crop production o hindi. So yung family part is very important. Ano? O at least itong subgroups and great groups who just tell you the temperature and the moisture content ng soil. So ito yun ha, ito yung gamit ng um, uh, pagganian yung ibibigay soil taxonomy. Uh, you've heard of Lipa series. Lipa is a common soil. Of course, galing siya sa Lipa. Doon siya na-discover, doon nakita. Usually, ang name ng soil ay binibigay eh kung saan siya unang natagpuan. So this was named from the town or landscape feature near the soil was first recognized. Uh, parang unahan lang yan eh. Kung unang na-describe, unang na-aral yung soil na yun. So ang nangyari, doon kinuha yung name. So ang Lipa series, for instance, is ang kanyang scientific name ay fine loamy mixed isohyperthermic. Ito yung word na isohyperthermic. Sura ko na sa Pilipinas yan. Okay? Fluvacentic ang kanyang subgroup. Ipiaqual. Yun yung kanyang group, great group, suborder, and order. Ang importante dito, it may sound difficult, but You have the family that would give you an idea 
of what type of soil ito. Kasi kung siya fine loamy, that's a good soil texture. Kaso mixed ang kanyang uh, clay minerals. Siya ay isohyperthermic, that means it's greater yung kanyang uh, 22 degrees centigrade or greater ang kanyang temperature. So definitely it's found in the Philippines. Actually, Lipa series is found in Batangas, in Lipa City, Lipa mismo. Okay? So, let's look at the 12 soil orders para mabalikan niyo yung ano yung mga orders na to epiacol. Ano yan? Okay? So, each order has a diagnostic epipedon and subsurface horizon which could be none. So, pwede merong epipedon pero pwedeng wala ding subsurface horizons pwede dit merong. So, there are 12 soil orders. Entisol, inceptisol, Andisols, podosols, molisols, alfisols, ultisols, oxisols, aridisols, vertisols, histosols, and jellysols. Bawat name niya ay sa origin, pag titingnan mo yan, ay meron niyang ibig sabihin and yun ang dapat malaman para alam mo na kaagad kung saan located itong mga soil na ito. Entisol, for instance. And entisol come from the word ent, meaning recent soils. These are very little development, halos wala pang horizon. In fact, karamihan na yung soils, ang tawag natin ay entisol. So that's very easy to memorize. Tingnan nyo ang AP or plow layer, 0 to 15 lang. Ano? Halos hindi pa siya makapal. And then yung kanya, diretso na kaagad C1 and C2. C1 is parent material na. C2 is parent material pa din. So if you will notice, ang soil niya ay 15 centimeters lang. Napaka baba, no? ay napaka minimal ng development. Again, yun ang entisol. Without doubt, yun na kaagad ang tawag. Okay? Entisols. These are examples of entisols. Meron ng A horizon lang ang matagpuan, tapos bedrock na kaagad sa ilalim. Those are entisols. So entisols characteristically have A or C or A or R horizons only. Exhibit only ephemeral soil development, largely confined to surface horizons. May have a plow layer. Meron siyang AP or plow layer horizon. Vertisols. So kanina, N, entisols. Ito naman, vertisols, earth. Okay, E-R-T. This comes from the word inverted. These are soils with high clay content, large shrink swell potential, and gradually invert on themselves, but gradually invert on themselves because of uh, alluviation and alluviation. Kaya nag invert itong soil na ito. Pero vertisols, ay mas, ang tinandaan ko dito sa vertisols, ay ang kanyang high clay content. Tapos because siya ay clay, napakataas ng kanyang shrink swell potential. Shrink swell ay pag dry, di maliliit yung soil, mag-shrink ka agad, pero kapag binasa mo, automatic mag-enlarge yung soil. In fact, vertisols ay merong mga cracks sa surface, sa field, pag iyong titing na. So yun yun ha, vertisols, inverted soils, okay? Inverted soils. Look at this one. <coughs> These are typical, typical characteristics of horizons ng vertisols. And you will find slick and slides. Slick and slides, slick and slides actually, ay, ay, yun yung indicator ng clay. Actually, siya yung, pag, pag ikaw ay nasa sa field, makita mo yan na very shiny siya. Tapos pag slice mo siya ng kitchen knife, which we use in, in classification, siya ay makintab talaga yung surface ng soil na yan. Slick and slide, slide ang tawag namin dun. Ngayon, Kapag siya mag-dry, yan merong cracks. Yun yung ginamit ko, yun yung tinandaan ko talaga. Pag vertisol, nagka-crack. Kasi yun yung swelling and shrinking ng soil. Kapag umulan, ayun, uh, basa yan, mag-swell mag, mag ka agad yan. Pag mag-dry, ganyan. Karamihan makikita nyo to sa mga lowland areas, sa clay soils. In fact, sa mga rice fields, marami itong nakikitang ganito, mga Vertisols. So global distribution of vertisols, Marians, Pilipinas. Sorry, ang liit ng map ko. Luma kasi itong map na to. So yun lang yun. Meron naman sa Philippines talaga. Karamihas tropical regions. Next, inceptisols. Inceptisols, if you will look at it, 
soil shows the beginning of horizon development, but there is no little or there is little or no alleviation pa ang nangyayari. But ang kaibahan niya doon sa INSEP, sa EN, ang INSEPTIZOL, ay meron na talagang horizon development. In fact, dito sa example, you can find ng A horizon ay A, a 0 to 18, ang iyong B horizon ay makapal na din 18 to 70 bago yung iyong uh, parent material. So ang inceptizols, may inception, may beginning na ng horizon development. Ang, intep, ang intep, inceptizol kanina, EN, ay E parang halos, wala pa talagang develop. Okay? Aridisols. So, madali ang aridisols. So, the word arid, meaning dry. So, this is less than 10 inches ang rainfall. And they usually contain carbonates because dahil wala nga ulan, nag-accumulate ang mga carbonates sa soil dahil bihira ang ulan. And usually found in the arid regions of the world. So, madali ito. Aridisol eh. Madali. Arid. Okay? Um, read this all. These are examples, usually sa mga desert, sa mga dry areas, you can find this. So, meron din namang horizons. Look at A, tapos B, T, B, K, B, K, Q, M, tapos yung, yung parent ma or bedrock. Uh, it's just moisture ang kulang, kulang dito. Ito yung sinasabing carbonates na nag-accumulate. Sodium salt accumulates on the surface and in the subsurface. Makita nyo talaga na white talaga siya. Makikita nyo parang asin siya sa itaas ng surface. Sa AZ horizon. Kaya AZ because of sodium chloride. Aridisols yan. Molisols. So what are molisols? Soils with thick, dark, soft horizon. These are molic or cambic or nitric or gelic or none. With high base saturation or not. So karamihan ng soils of the grasslands. So molic ang tawag, molly soils. Okay? Very, very thick itong mga soil na to um, uh, because of development already. So these are global distributions of molly soils. So madali ang molly soils ano, dahil sa development niya. Spodosols. Spodosols are acid, sandy soils with thick E horizon and red Red, sorry, red B horizons that are ochric and spodic. Uh, if you remember, kung ibig sabihin natin ng ochric and spodic, that is the presence ng mga, uh, sorry, chemicals um, to, to identify acid soils, iron, aluminum oxides, or sesky oxides. So spodosols, okay? Alphysols. What are alphysols? These are fertile forested soils. With ochreic specific nga lang, ano, ochreic and argillic horizons that are high base saturation. So greater than 35% are forested soils, karamihan, alfi soils. Um, global distribution of alfi soils in the world. And then ulti soils, these are soils that are more weathered than alfi soils, ochreic and argillic siya. Low ang kanyang base saturation kasi high yung isa. Less than 35%. These are redder and more acid than alfisol. So red ang color. So we call it ultisols. Yung mga ganun. Red soils actually. Histosols. So the easiest to memorize because these are organic soils. We call it peat soils. Histic ang kanyang horizon. So it's either undecomposed to slightly decomposed and waterlogged yung mga soil na to. So this is easiest to identify. Kapag map naman na soils, these are highly decomposed or organic matter, you cannot distinguish it anymore. Yun ang kaibahan sa peat, ha? yung map, histosols pa din, ang classification. Usually they have 20% or higher ng percent organic matter. And these soils, these are soils from volcanic origin, so volcanic ejecta, those are formed near volcanic areas, ash, cinder, pumice, and basalt. Very light ang mga soils na ito, and very low or low ang bulk density. Pag low bulk density, you're talking here of 1 or 1.1 lamang or less than 1 ang bulk density nila. 
you call it undissolved. Maganda siyang tandaan kasi volcano, volcanic area, so undissolved. So early stage to, sec to, to secondary minerals, alophanes, immobilites, and very hydrate clays. Remember, alophanes and immobilites are product of volcanic eruptions. Kaya specific yung mga minerals na yun or clay na matagpuan nyo sa, and, uh, sa soil na kinaklassify as undissolved. Ah, high phosphorus fixing capacity. Now, this is typical ng mga volcanic soils or andesols. Uh, mataas ang kanyang, although okay ang kanyang phosphate content, content pero maranasan ang deficiency ng phosphorus because of its high fixing capacity. Because of the presence ng allophanes or emogolites or iron hydride clays sa soil. Kaya andesols have high fixing capacity. Oxisols. Ayan. Soils with oxic horizon. These are very weathered soils of the tropics. Low pH acid soils with high 1 is to 1 uh, clay minerals. Uh, ito yun, mga red soils. Uh, ito yung sinasabi ko sa inyo. Nakikita nga natin doon sa, ano, eh, sa Laguna ito. So very red soils karamihan. Low pH. Ibig sabihin acidic. Okay. Um, okay. Distribution. Meron pang isa, jelly soil. Now, wala naman ito sa atin from the word gel. New order as of 1998. These are soils with permafrost. Uh, formerly classified as cryopreps or frozen inceptisols. But in 1998, hindi walay na siya ng USDA. As a new order, these are jelly soils. These are permafrost in permafrost areas. I mean, ice talaga. May permanent uh, ice or snow. Okay. So, uh, cool climate, siyempre, ang jelly soils. Any parent material, often glacial drift. So, let's move on after knowing the orders. Sa, sa, soil, so, sa soil survey, uh, in-include ko ito kasi uh, lumalabas talaga ito sa board exam. Yung three main elements sa inventory ng soil resource sa soil survey. So three main elements, usually a map showing the geographic relationship of its soil, a text describing the soil, and tables that will give you physical and chemical data and inter interpretations for various uses. So ito yung mga elements ng soil survey na makikita. And sa soil survey, a soil survey describes the characteristics of the soils in a given area. Usually a province is the unit of publication classifies the soil according to a standard system of classification. In this case, we are using USDA. Plots the boundaries of the soils on a map, and the map uses an aerial photo as the base. Makes predictions about the behavior of the soils. Uh, sorry, ito yung, ito yung purpose, ito yung overall goal uh, or work na ginagawa ng soil survey. Again, so usually sa board exam, yung tinatanong, anong gamit ng soil survey? Ang pinaka-importante dito ay yung makes predictions about the behavior or characteristics of the soil. And usually the soil survey, sila yung nag-produce ng mga soil maps that we have. Yung may mga shape file tayo sa GLS. Sa map scale naman, of course, you know that soil maps differ in their scale. Map scale refers to how many inches on the map represents inches on the ground. A scale of 1 is to 24,000 says 1 inch of the map is equivalent to 24,000 inches or actually 24,000 kilometers on the ground or meters on the ground. For the orders of soil survey, merong iba-ibang classing uh, soil survey reports. They are classified into first order, second order, third order, fourth order, and fifth order. Ang um, first order is very intensive, very detailed. Makikita mo experimental plots, building sites, minimum size delineation, is usually one hectare. Yun yung pinaka-intensive na, pinaka-matindi ng pag-aaral sa karakteristik ng soil. We call it first order. The second order is also intensive, detailed, pero kasama sa kanya ang general agriculture sa area, urban planning, minimum size delineation, and consider dito second order, ang area is 0.6 to 4 hectares na, ang coverage niya. Remember, ang first order ay less than one hectare yun. A third order, extensive na siya. You're talking here of 16 hectares, rangelands, for, for community area planning, 
and ang minimum size delineation niya is 1.6 to 16 hectares na. So ang fourth order, siya na yung extensive or recognize, recognizance type for broad, broad land use potential and general land management. Minimum size niya, you're talking here already of 16 to 250 hectares, ang fourth order. And of course, ang fifth order, these are for regional planning, exploratory planning, national planning. Ang minimum size delineation niya ay 250 to 4,000 hectares. So ang first order, ang pinaka-intensive, pinaka-maliit, and ang fifth order, yun yung mga bigger ng area. So you have an idea sa sizes, sa first order, second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order, survey reports. So yan, pareho lang to. Order 1, very detailed. Order 2, semi-detailed. Order 3, recognizance survey. 4, general soil map. 5, regional map. Kaya kung may tanong sa board exam, may ipakita na example sa isang region na you're talking of order 5 doon sa soil soil. This one is an example of those maps na product ng um, surveys. This is a command sa Sunday Clay Loam. Ito ang characteristics. Makikita niyo yung mga tables ng ganito sa mga soil survey maps. So, uh, ito ay sa Davao area. Ano? These are regional maps. So, this is the fifth order report sa soil survey. Ayan, makita niyo ang pH, strongly acid, NPK is generally low, CEC is very high, BS is medium. O magulat ka, ang NPK niya mababa lang pero mataas ang cation exchange capacity. Ang base saturation is medium. The source of parent material were identified as shales and sandstones with water-worn gravel and sand. Effective soil depth is shallow. So ibig sabihin pag shallow, less than 100 or 100. Um, soils na less than 100 are usually shallow. Soil color, yellowish brown, light brown to brown using the Mansell color chart. Dominant relief, hilly to mountainous. Surface drainage, well-drained. Subsurface drainage, somewhat well-drained. Flooding hazard, wala kasi siya ay hilly. Now, if you will look at this one, what can we get from these types of soil reports? So in this case, you would... Okay. In this case, you would have an idea already of the pH, and you have an idea of the, the fertility of the soil, NPK. Pero magandang indicator, ang cation exchange capacity, ha? CEC, very high, kahit low ang NPK. The base saturation is medium. Uh, I think, uh, sasabihin nyo, bakit kaya mababa ang NPK kahit mataas ang CEC? Basically, because of the pH, dahil siya ay strongly acid. So from here, you can even have an idea Kung paano natin i-manage ang soil? Yun yun sa board exam, siguro ang mga tanong would be, like how do you, what, what information you get from this report and what you can recommend for management? I think yun ang sample lang, very quickly, meron pang tugbok soil uh, map here I have for land characteristics, strongly acid, medium high, MBS medium, source ng parent material are Igneous rocks, predominantly undecides. Effective soil depth, deep. So these are deeper soils. Soil color, brown to weak, reddish brown. Dominant relief, undulating to gently rolling. So that is relatively flat. Surface drainage, well-drained. Subsurface, well-drained. Flooding hazard, none. So again, you have idea here of information that you can get from soil survey maps. I think that's it, Brian. Uh, um, unless, uh, okay, friends, I think that's it. I don't know if you have questions. Uh, we can go back. Okay. Yan. Thank you very much, sir, sa time and for lecturing. Ayan. So, marami po kami natutunan ngayong hapon. Oh, ma. Soil survey and soil taxonomy. So, mm -hmm. dalawa sa pinakamahirap na subjects, actually. Pero... Yan. Kung sino may mga katanungan muna, ayan, before ako magbigay ng aking mga experiences sa soil science. Ayan. Itanong na natin kay sir. And then sir, sabi pa nga ni sir Felix, dahil daw sa'yo, nakapasal daw siya. Ayan, sino, dahil kompleto ang notes niya. Si sir Felix po. Ay, Felix. Oh, oh. 
Yes, yung top six po. Uh, yeah, usually I think ang lumabas nga daw, kwento nila, doon, wala kasi ako, hindi ako nakatry ha sa board exam, sorry. Uh, ang mga lumabas, usually ay binibigay yung, yung tulad nito, anong purpose, anong, anong, anong gamit ng cell survey, or meron yun nga yung pinakita ito, uh, soil orders definitely lumabas, pero yung mga lumabas talaga rens daw na mahirap-hirap, is merong, sorry ha, uh, binalisan ko lang. Balikan ko yung, yung kaninang pinakita ko sa inyo. Ito. So lumalabas yan and then pinainterpret <laughs> kung ano yung, anong soil yan. Kung ano so, or what, what you can get from it. So para hindi masyado mahirapan, look at the, the family. It's the family which is very important. Depende sa tanong siyempre. Pag ang itanong ay mga texture or mga, mga temperature, then you would know yung isohyperthermic, ano, etc. Okay, baka may question sila. Ayun, sino pong may katanungan? Ayan. Pwede na natin tanungin si Sir ngayon habang andyan pa siya. <laughs> parang, parang takot yata sila magtanong sa survey. Parang takot. De, madali lang oh. siya, parang mahirap lang tingnan pero pag first time nga talaga talagang magulat ka uh, pero huwag matakot uh, that's very uh, easy pag mag soil survey, hindi naman kasi namin minememorize, meron kaming manual friends na hawak yes. so you don't have to memorize okay. so, ang, idea, mm, ang idea makita nyo yung parang immediate information na makukuha nyo. Definitely yung mga orders, yung 12 na diniscuss ko kanina, are these all lalabas yon. Molly souls ko ano ang molly souls, verti souls. May questions nga daw sa board na ang soil ay nagka-crack during summer and then heavy, um, uh, mas sticky siya, hirap mag-plow during wet season. Okay. Obvious naman na siya ay verti souls, di ba? Yung mataas yun. Verti souls. Mhm. Ayun. Sige, baka naman na-overloading kayo. So, ayun. Baka iniisip pa nila, sir, kung ano yung mga kailangan nilang itanong. Yung mm -hmm. May katanungan, i-PM nyo lang kami and then we'll ask, sir. And okay na po ba yun, sir? And then we will... Uh, tapos kayo na po yung sasagot. Tapos i-send na lang namin directly sa kanila. Yeah, sige. Uh, pwede naman later. Kahit i-PM nyo na lang okay. kasi I'm also leaving. Meron din akong ibang appointment kung wala na silang tanong. And you can give way to other lectures. Napahaba ako. Sorry, yes, Renza. Hindi ko na kinayang. Mabilis na mabilis. Okay lang po, sir. Actually, mahaba talaga ang taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Hindi kaya ng isang upuan mm -hmm. lang. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, kung wala na, of course, sir, we will give you our, the certificate. May read the citation. Certificate of Appreciation is proudly presented to Professor Noel Sadigo in recognition of his outstanding contribution as volunteer for, the, for sharing knowledge during Padayan Hiraya Manuari pre layer review sessions on April 3, 2022. Signed, Renz J. Caducoy, organizer. Signed, Felix S. Valdez, organizer, and signed, Brian Angelo Sustrina, head organizer. Yan po. Palapakan naman natin. Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Thank you very time. much sa inyo. Sige. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, pag may question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you po. Bye, Ay. bye. Alis mo na ako, okay. ha? Thank you. Sir, mag sir mag-picture sir. lang po muna. Sir. Ah, Brian, <laughs> picture lang po muna. Thank you pa daw. A picture. Okay, Brian. Sige. Wait lang po. Renz, pa-stop share na lang, Renz. Ay, okay. Sorry po. Ayan, wait lang po. <laughs> oh, Marami-rami na kayo. Naka-46 na pala. Okay. Wait lang po. Ayan, makiki-open na lang po ng mga cameras natin. <laughs> mga kayo po mag-open. Hello po. Ayan. Wait lang po. Marami-raming... Marami Hindi, dalawa lang po pala. Pakihold na lang po ng mga ngiti natin. One... Two, one, two, three. Sa pa po, 
One, two, three. Ayan. Okay na po. Okay. Na po. Salamat thank po. You, thank you. Thank, thank you, you po. Thank you po. Thank you, sir. Ayan po. Ayan. Uh, let's have a uh, one minute stretching. Ayun. Para naman uh, water break, uh, see your break, para naman ma-prepare natin yung sarili natin para sa susunod na uh, speaker. So, buhay pa ba kayo? Bakit ba ang late na yun ninyo? Ha? Nag-inral na ba kayo sa mga review centers? Ha? May review centers na ba kayo, Charis? Hindi nyo na ba kami mahal, Charis? Ha? So far, may mga review centers na nagparamdam at nagsishare. Ayan. Ang review center na uphold. Uphold? Uphold. Tama. Uh, wala akong na pinaplug pero yun yung mga nakikita. Uphold, upstep. Yung from the University of the Philippines. Ang uphold, if I'm not mistaken, 3,500. Yun. Doon nag-review si Ma'am Ella and me and Sir Brian Uphold. Then, then ako rin sa upstep. Upstep. Dalawang review center ko. Share ko lang. So, if okay ng lahat, ayan, let's move on to our next speaker. Ayan, tapos ang picture taking. Okay, our next speaker is a graduate of... Um, Bachelor of Agricultural Technology at uh, Southern, Southern Luzon State University. And he's, she is a licensed agriculturist um, and currently an instructor of Southern Luzon State University. Siya uh, pala ay cum laude, of course. And current uh, he also she also graduated her masters of science in horticulture minor in soil science in university of the philippines lost body let us welcome miss cheryl uh, cheryl bundal bundalian yeah hi ma'am hello good afternoon hello po. good afternoon po Okay, so gusto ko lang mag-greet muna sa lahat ng participants sa ating mga future agriculturists. Magandang tanghali or hapon. At shout out sa kung meron man akong students na nakikinig ngayon siguro sa live. So yun, good afternoon. So share ko na din yung aking screen. So, yan. Nakikita na naman po, ano? Okay. So, yes po. Nakikita na po. And so, yung topic ko for today is about plant growth and development. So, alam ko na basic na sa inyo tong topic na to. And maiksi lang. Maiksi lang din tong uh, pin, na, na-prepare ko. So, yan. So, first, let us define kung ano ba yung growth. So, yan. So alam naman natin na growth. So ito yung uh, irreversible permanent change in increase in size, weight or mass. So yan. So kapag growth, so irreversible meaning kapag uh, uh, nag-increase na yung size or weight, so hindi na siya pwedeng uh, bumalik doon sa kanyang previous uh, size or weight. So kapag ganun yung nangyari, so hindi growth or kasi shrinking ang mangyayari kung ka uh, babalik siya sa or liliit. So, yun yung ating growth. So, yung ating plants ay uh, unique sa yung kanyang characteristics sa growth. So, unlimited yung kanyang pag-grow through its life cycle. So, dahil yan, doon sa kanyang mga meristematic cells na uh, pwedeng mag-divide, uh, mag-continuously na mag-divide at mag-self-perpetuate. So, yan. So, um, we have uh, three stages of cellular growth. So, una dito 
is yung ating cell division. So, yung ating cell division, so ito yung uh, pag-increase ng number ng cells due to mitosis. So, alam natin na yung mitosis is yung uh, yung ating eukaryotic cell nucleus is nag split siya into two. And then, yung ating uh, parent cell ay nagde-divide para makapag-produce ng two daughter cells. So, after na magkaroon tayo ng uh, cell division is yung mga uh, na-divide na cell is mag undergo ng cell enlargement. Kung saan, sa cell enlargement, dito naman yung uh, nag increase yung size ng uh, cells natin. So, uh, dahil to sa pag-increase or dun sa increased volume ng protoplasm. So, yung protoplasm, dito naman, uh, nandito yung ating cytoplasm and nucleus. So, ito yung nagka-carry ng ating uh, genetic material and then ito din yung responsible para sa control ng ating cells. So after noon, after na nagkaroon ng cell division, nagkaroon ng cell enlargement, so yung cells ay mag undergo na ng cell differentiation. So kapag uh, cell differentiation, ito yung stage kung saan yung cells ay uh, magfo-form na ng kanyang specific uh, uh, form structure and uh, mag, uh, magagawa niya na yung kanyang particular or specific na function. And then, yung mga cells which has uh, similar uh, functions and form ay magsasama-sama to form a group na ang tawag naman ay tissue. So, yan. And then, ito, uh, para comparison ng ating cell division and cell enlargement. So, Kita nyo dito sa kabila ay yung ating uh, cell division. So yan, after mag-divide ng uh, parent cell at makapag-produce ng two daughter cells. So yan. And then itong kabila, yung isang individual cell ay mag-enlarge or lalaki. So yan yung pinagkaiba between cell division and cell enlargement. So next is yung forms naman natin ng growth. So meron tayong uh, primary and secondary growth. So kapag primary growth, so ang responsible dito ay yung ating mga uh, apical meristems. So yan, yung ating apical meristems pwedeng uh, shoot or yung ating root. So as you can see doon sa ating uh, picture or figure is yung ating uh, apical meristems ay makikita sa terminal bud and then yung ating root apical meristems is doon sa ating root cup. So sila yung responsible para sa elongation. So elongation ng shoot and elongation ng root. So yun yung uh, primary growth. Well, kapag naman uh, secondary growth, so ang responsible naman dito is yung ating uh, lateral meristem, yung ating uh, vascular and corcambium. So, sila naman yung uh, nagbibigay ng increase sa girt ng ating uh, stem. So, yan. Kapag uh, primary growth, so yung, uh, cell elong yung elongation and then increase naman ng uh, girt kapag secondary growth. So, yan. And then, we have uh, three phases of growth. So, meron tayong meristematic, meron tayong elongation, or phase of enlargement, and the maturation. So, dito mas makikita natin siya sa picture. So, sa phases of growth. So, ito yung, uh, yung illustration is yung sa roots naman natin. So, sa meristematic or formative phase, or ito yung, uh, nandito yung zone of cell division. So, ang responsible dito ay yung ating mga meristematic uh, cells, which is yun nga, yung uh, apical meristem. So, dito sa roots is the root apex. So, yan. So, dito nangyayari yung rapid na cell division. And then, uh, yun, tuloy-tuloy yung uh, pag-cell uh, divide and pag-elongate. And then, proximal to that is the uh, zone of elongation so or the phase of enlargement. So, dito naman, after yung 
katabi or taas ng no, ating tips is uh, dito nangyayari yung uh, cell enlargement, vacuolation or yung formation ng vacuoles and yung deposition ng new cell wall. And then, after nun, proximal to the zone of elongation is the... Bakit ayaw? Wait lang. Is the zone of maturation. So, dito naman sa zone of maturation, nangyayari yung uh, thickening and lignification. So, dito sa maturation, so uh, parang hindi na nawawala na ng capacity yung ating cells to divide. So, kapag uh, nagkaroon na ng cell wall thickening and lignification, tapos uh, yung ating uh, cells in nagmature na, and then it will uh, proceed na na mag-perform ng kanyang uh, specific function. So, yan. So, phases of growth is the meristematic or the formative phase kung saan rapid yung uh, cell division and elongation and and then sa elongation is yan nga yung uh, uh, for, formation ng vacuole and then deposition ng new cell wall and yan elongation and then sa maturation nangyayari yung cell wall thickening and lignification so yan nagmamature na yung cells and nag nagperform na ng kanyang uh, particular function Next is, wait lang, is the growth rate. So, yung growth rate is yung pag-measure natin ng increased growth per unit time. So, dito sa growth rate, meron tayong dalawang types. So, ang una is yung ating arithmetic growth. So, pag arithmetic growth, so, dito sa growth na ito, constant lang yung growth per unit time. Kumbaga, as, uh, uh, per unit time, pareho lang yung pag-increase ng growth. So, hindi siya nababago-bago unlike na slow, tapos magiging rapid, tapos magiging slow ulit. So, dito kay arithmetic growth. So, constant or hindi nag-change yung uh, rate ng growth. So, Pwede natin siya ma-compute using this formula. And then, this formula stands for this. So, kailangan masukat yung initial length. And then, the initial length after time. And then, the growth per unit time. So, dito sa... Tapos yung R is the growth rate per unit time. Okay. So, dito sa arithmetic uh, growth, so ang kanyang uh, curve or kanyang graphical representation is... Okay, wait lang. Ay, lumabas. Yeah. So, yeah. So, linear. Yung kanyang uh, representation since constant nga yung rate per unit time. So, linear yung kanyang uh, magiging itsura kapag igin rough or... Ayan, ipinlot yung growth rate. So, yan. So, second is the geometric growth. So, kapag naman geometric growth, so, ito naman ay uh, represented by the three phases, which is the log, the log, and the stationary phase. So, mamaya, isa-isahin natin. So, this uh, geometric growth could be computed using this formula. So, this stands for the initial size. So, it can be increased in the number of cells, weight, or height. And then, the size after time and the growth per unit time or also referred to as the efficiency index and the base of the natural log. So, yeah. So, Ito, yung uh, growth curve naman ng ating geometric growth. So, dito makikita natin sa kanyang growth curve, during log phase, slow lang yung growth na ma-observe natin dito. And this usually happens during uh, seed germination. So, yan. So, slow pa lang yung uh, growth. So, slow pa lang yung cell division, ganyan. And then, pupunta tayo 
ngayon yung plant ay mag-undergo na nung uh, or mapupunta na doon sa exponential or log phase. Kung saan dito naman nagiging rapid na yung growth. And yun na maximum nagkakaroon na ng maximum uh, na paggrow dito. So usually kapag uh dito mga vegetative to flowering stage ganyan. And then Next phase is the stationary phase wherein nag-slow down na ulit yung growth ng ating plants. So dito sa stationary phase, pwedeng uh, nangyayari siya dahil uh, lacking na yung ating nutrients or uh, hindi na sufficient yung nutrients for growth. So pwedeng yun ang magpas ng stationary. And then as uh, nag-slow down na yung growth and then pwedeng matigil na talaga yung uh, pag-grow and then mag-lead na sa death ng ating plants. So, yan. So, this curve is called a sigmoid curve or the S-curve since it somehow ay para nagpo-form ng S-curve. -S so, yan. Sigmoid curve ang tawag dito sa uh, kind ng growth curve na ito. So, ayan. So, to further uh, explain itong ating pinagkaiba ng ating arithmetic and geometric growth. So, sa arithmetic growth, yung, uh, di ba, sa mitosis, so, yung parent cell ay magde-divide into two daughter cells. So, sa arithmetic growth, doon sa dalawang daughter cells, isa lang yung pwedeng mag-divide continually. And then, the other one ay pwedeng... Uh, mag-undergo na siya ng cell differentiation and maturation. So, in this uh, figure, makikita nyo, so yung blue represents yung mga cells na uh, may capacity pa para mag-undergo ng cell division. While yung uh, white naman is yung mga cells na wala ng capacity na mag-divide. So, yan. So, dito, kung makikita nyo, so, uh, sa geometric eto oh, yung pag uh, nag-undergo na ng cell division so yung lahat ng cells ay blue meaning lahat sila ay uh, may capacity pa na magkaroon ng cell division unlike doon sa arithmetic na yan yung iba nagse-cell divide pero yung iba ay nag-undergo na ng cell differentiation ayan so next so, we can measure growth. So, paano nga ba natin na may measure ang growth? So, alam na alam na natin na na may measure ang growth sa pagsukat ng increase in uh, fresh weight or dry weight. So, yan. Kapag ka tayo ay nag a ng ating uh, mga halaman. So, a-approve, dilinisin, and then iwi-way. And then, pwede rin siya na as a whole plant or pwede din naman na paghiwalayin yung shoot or end root ratio. And then, next is kap, sa pagsukat ng increase in length. So, increase in length, yung sukatin natin, yung haba ng shoot, haba ng root. So, yan. And then, area. So, yung pagsukat ng area ng leaves. And then, sa volume. So, pagsukat naman ng volume ng ating fruits. And then, cell number in regard doon sa ating mga algae, bacteria, ganyan. So, yan. Sobrang, uh, di ba, amazing no ating mga plants since, for example, yung uh, kagaya ng isang maze. Sa maze, so yung uh, isang cell or isang root apex could uh, divide ng more than 17,500 or mag-undergo yung isang uh, root apex ng maze ng more than 17,500 divisions per hour. So, sobrang rapid nung uh, pag-grow at pag-divide ng ating uh, no, mga uh, plant cells. So, yan. So, what are the essential elements required naman for growth? So, alam ko na alam na alam na din natin to. So, first is water. So, syempre alam natin na sobrang essential ng water pa, sa growth ng ating plants. So, kung walang water... So, impossible na magkaroon ng, ng growth. Since si water is uh, required for the enzymatic activity, 
So, hindi magpo-proceed ang mga physiological processes without water. So, also sa germination, kailangan ng water. So, yan. And then, turgidity helps in growth. So, another one is the oxygen, which is required for respiration. So, and metabolism of organic compounds is released, energy required for growth. So, yan. So, alam natin na sa respiration. So, ah... Uh, Ang requisites ng respiration is yung organic compounds and then oxygen. So, yung dalawang yon ay kapag nagkaroon na ng reaction ay magpo-produce ng carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that energy ay form ng ATP, which is yung ATP is required naman para sa uh, mag-proceed yung mga metabolic processes ng ating plants. So, next. Next is macro and micronutrients required as an energy source and for the synthesis of protoplasm. So yan. So kaya nga, di ba, nag apply tayo ng mga fertilizers para isupply yung mga nutrients na kailangan ng ating plants. So kapag, lalo na kapag insufficient yung uh, nutrients sa soil, so kailangan natin mag-add para uh, ma ma-sustain natin or ma-supplyan natin ng nutrients yung ating plants na required ni required naman para sa kanilang optimum growth. So yan. And also, syempre kailangan pa rin ng optimum temperature since alam natin na may uh, iba't ibang plants, iba't iba yung uh, climatic requirements, iba't iba yung uh, kanyang uh, temperature na uh, mag-grow siya optimally. So, may plants na uh, pwedeng mag-grow optimally sa tropic na climate. Yung iba naman ay dun sa mga malalamig. So, yan. Salinity, light. So, syempre, light is required for photosynthesis. And iba pang environmental factors that may affect growth. So, malaking effect ang environmental factors lalo na kapag uh, pwede siyang mag cause ng stress sa ating plants. So, pwede siyang uh, mag-cause, kunwari, kapag kulang ng water, drought stress, kapag sobra, what, uh, flooding stress, ganyan. So, this uh, mga environmental factors ay talagang nakaka-affect nakaka doon sa pag-attain ng maximum growth ng ating plants. So, next is yung ating ano naman. Punta naman tayo sa differentiation, the differentiation, and redifferentiation. So, sa differentiation, so, dito yung meristematic cells differentiate and undergo structural changes to perform a specific function. So, kanina, di ba, sabi natin, kapag differentiation, so, yung, yung cell after ng cell division, cell enlargement, and then cell differentiation dito nangyayari yung uh, magpo-form na siya ng specific form or specific structure and then uh, magagawa niya na yung kanyang specific function and then sa cell cycle so after differentiation pwede mag-proceed yung cell into the differentiation so dito naman sa the differentiation yung mga differentiated cells ay magkakaroon ulit ng ability to divide and differentiate. So, yung differentiated cells na meron na siyang specific structure and form, so pwede pa ulit siyang mag-differentiate or magkaroon ulit siya ng ability to divide and differentiate again to perform uh, another uh, particular function. And then, this, the differentiated cells could proceed na dito sa uh, tinatawag na redifferentiation. So dito naman sa redifferentiation, so the dedifferentiated cells, so nawawalan na naman nawawalan na ng capacity to divide. So itong ulit kapag redifferentiation, so itong dedifferentiated cells ay mawawalan na siya ng uh, capacity to divide and and then it will mature na and perform its uh, specific function so dito na magmamature magmamature na yung uh, cells and then pwede rin naman na after ng uh, the differentiation 
ay ma- mawala na ng uh, uh, capacity to or maging dead na yung uh, mga cells. So, yan. Or pwede na siyang magkaroon ng, ayan, cell death. So, yan. So, again, the differentiation kapag uh, yung uh, cells ay nagkaroon na ng specific uh, for structure and function and then this differentiated cells will regain its ability to divide and differentiate the differentiation ang tawag. And then kapag yung cell ay nawala ay nawala na ng capacity to divide and nagmature na. So ang tawag na sa kanya ay uh, redifferentiation. Okay. So next. So development naman tayo. So ano ba ang meaning ng development? So development is yung whole series of qualitative and quantitative changes such as growth, differentiation, and maturation which an organism undergoes throughout its life cycle. So, kapag development, so dito nangyayari yung uh, kakaroon na ng uh, iba't ibang uh, form. So, from a seed and then hanggang sa nag-germinate yung seed, hanggang na produce na yung kanyang first true leaves, nagkaroon siya ng uh, uh, roots, and then Uh, nag-develop pa siya at uh, nag-under, nag, ano na siya sa kanyang vegetative stage, sa kanyang flowering stage, sa kanyang uh, adult stage, yan, hanggang sa uh, mag-end na yung uh, life ng plant. So, yun yung uh, development. So, syempre, dahil nga ang ating uh, plants ay affected by the environmental stimulus or the environmental factors. So, uh, yung ating plants can form different types of structures in response to these various environmental conditions. So, example of that is the uh, heterophily. So, itong pag sinabing heterophily, so ito naman yung uh, nangyayari dito is yung leaves ng plants ay nagkakaroon ng ibang, magkaibang shape depending sa kanyang uh, pwedeng affected siya ng uh, stages of life nung halaman or pwede din naman na dahil doon sa environmental condition na kanyang na-expose siya. So, yon yung heterophily. So, ito yung example. So, kita nyo dito sa uh, illustration. So, itong example natin, so si Lux Par. So, at juvenile stage, ganyan yung shape ng kanyang leaves. While at adult stage, ganyan naman yung shape nung uh, kanyang leaves. And isa pang example ng heterophily is yung ating buttercup. So, sa, pag siya ay uh, exposed sa terrestrial habitat, so ganyan yung itsura nung kanyang leaves. While kapag naman siya ay nasa aquatic habitat, ganyan naman yung nagiging itsura nung kanyang leaves. So, yan. So, heterophily, kapag nag-iiba yung uh, shape ng leaves ng uh, halaman, depending doon sa kanyang environmental conditions na exposed and sa stage ng kanyang life cycle. So, yan. So, factors controlling development is we have two, the intrinsic factors and the extrinsic factors. So, intrinsic factors, so ito... Uh, nandito yung uh, effect ng genetic ng ating halaman. So, pwede din naman na controlled by the hormones. So, di ba yung ating mga phytohormones, yung ating mga oxen, jeberelin, cytokinin, GBA, yan. So, sila ay uh, may control doon sa iba't ibang physiological processes ng ating halaman. So, Another is yung in- extrinsic, which is, ito naman yung factors involved ay yung mga environmental factors, such yung oxygen, temperature, water, nutrients, etc. So, yan. And then, uh, plant growth regulator. So, alam ko parang sabi na discuss na daw itong plant growth regulators, pero i-reiterate lang natin kung ano yung uh, physiological 
uh, effects nitong mga uh, plant growth regulators na ito na nakaka-affect sa plant growth and development. So, ano ba nga yung uh, plant growth regulators? So, plant growth regulators ay yung mga chemical compounds found in uh, plants. So, they are found naturally in plants or pwede din naman na itong uh, plant hormones ay maging uh, synthetically produced. And also, it is known as the plant hormone or the phytohormones. And it is present in very low concentrations and acts as chemical signals between cells. So, yan. So, una, so ito yung mga main phytohormones lang aking uh, ano, didiscuss. So, physiological effects of auxin. So, yan. So, alam natin na ang auxin is responsible for apical dominance. So, pag sinabing apical dominance, so mas uh, increased yung uh, pag-elongate nung, or ayun nga, pag-elongate nung mga apical meristems more than doon sa lateral meristems. So, mas nag-elongate more than nag increase yung gear kapag nagkakaroon ng apical dominance. So, also, auxin induces cell differentiation in xylem and induces partenocarpy or yung uh, formation ng fruits without fertilization. So, dyan tayo nakaka-produce ng mga fruits na seedless like sa tomatoes. And it also promotes flowering sa mga uh, example ay pineapple. And then... It also delays abscission. So, uh, tandaan na sa auxin, nade-delay niya ang abscission kung ito ay nasa uh, younger stage so or young, sa young leaves. So, kunwari mag apply tayo exogenously ng auxin. So, kapag younger leaves, sa, kapag sa younger leaves ka nag-apply, it could delay abscission or yung abscission is the falling of uh, leaves, fruits, Ganyan, or flowers, ganyan. And then, kapag naman uh, in-apply mo si auxin sa older leaves or sa mga mature leaves, it would uh, induce or promote abscission. So, it also root, it also promotes root initiation in stem cuttings for vegetative propagation. Yan. So, kapag uh, uh, meron tayong mga a crops na pinoproduce through cutting so si auxin ay nakakatulong para mag uh, mas mapabilis na mag uh, karoon ng roots yung ating mga stem cuttings and then 24D is a kind of auxin which is widely used as herbicide to kill dicot weeds or the broad leaf weeds so, uh, next is the physiological effects naman ng gibberellins, which is uh, stimulates or promotes cell elongation and also it delays senescence. So, yeah, nakapigil sa senescence. And then, stimulate mating process and internode elongation and also promote maturation and seed germination. So, yeah. So, si Jiberilin ay uh, responsible para ma-break yung uh, seed, dormancy, seed dormancy since siya yung nakaka-promote ng uh, germination. And then, in, kay cytokinin naman, so si cytokinin, so siya yung nagpo-promote ng cell division, callus formation, and inhibition of apical dominance. So, kabaliktaran ni auxin, na nagpo-promote ng apical dominance, si cytokinin naman, ang napopromote niya ay yung lateral shoot growth. Okay. So, next, it also delays sleep senescence. So, ang palatandaan ko dito dati, kapag si cytokinin ay pampabata hormone. Kasi yung experiment namin, yung dinetouch yung leaves, and then uh, parang in-imbibe siya doon sa, or sa solution na merong cytokinin tapos wala. So, Yung wala, syempre, nag-yellow agad while yung cytokinin, yung merong cytokinin, so, 
mas napatagal yung pagyelo ng leaves. So it also uh, promotes embryo development and seed germination, and also promotes nutrient metabolism. So nutrient metabolism since uh, related yon doon sa uh, pag uh, delay ng senesen since si uh, cytokine meron siyang effect na kapag inapply mo siya doon sa isang side doon mas pupunta yung uh, mga nutrients kaya din hindi mas mabilis na nagyellow yung part ng leaves na uh, naapply ng cytokine so next is yan formation sa formation din ng chloroplast in leaves so kaya din uh, hindi siya mabilis nagyellow lalo na kapag din touch kasi nga uh, yung cytokine ay nakakatulong para mag-form ng chloroplast sa leaves. So, next, it also promotes an adventitious shoot formation. And then, the physiological effects of ethylene. So, dito naman, syempre, alam natin, a ripening hormone, ethylene, and, yan, so, ripening hormone ng ating mga uh, fruits. And also, ethylene stimulates senescence and abscission of leaves, flowers, and fruits. So, yan. Kay ethylene, tandaan, kakibat niya si senescence. Papabilis ni ethylene ang senescence and abscission ng ating leaves, flowers, and fruits. And maintenance of apical hook on seedlings. And break seed and bud dormancy and initiates seed germination. So, si ethylene ay nagpo-promote din ng seed germination. And then, root initiation. And internode and petiole elongation in water plants. And also, it promotes flowering and femaleness. So, kapag in-apply exogenously ang ethylene, it will promote female. Yung flowers niya, ay mas mapopromote ay uh, female, such doon sa mga cucumbers and mangos. So next, sa abscisic acid naman. So abscisic acid, so alam, tandaan natin na ang abscisic acid yung nakakapag-inhibit ng germination. At siya yung uh, cause kung bakit meron tayong endogenous dormancy na pwedeng, uh, pwedeng mataas yung concentration ng ABA doon sa loob ng seed or doon sa embryo kaya walang or hindi na po prom, or hindi uh, nakakaroon ng germination at nag stay as dormant yung ating seeds. And also, responsible siya doon sa ating closing and opening ng ating stomates. So, sa transpiration. So, yan. Ano din si ABA? Responsible. And then, seed development and maturation. So, yun. And then, Next is photoperiodism. So, ang photoperiodism is ito naman yung effect ng exposure ng ating plants sa duration sa light. So, naapektuhan niya ang plant growth and development especially sa flowering ng ating plants. So, meron tayong tatlong type which is yung short day na nai-initiate yung kanyang flower flowering kapag siya ay exposed sa uh, short day light duration or short day or short light duration so pag uh, mas uh, maikse yung exposure sa light ng plants na ito so mas nang initiate ang flowering so example rice soybean ganyan and then sa long day plants naman na initiate ang flowering kapag ka ang uh, plants ay exposed sa longer light duration. So, examples dito ay uh, lettuce. And then, kapag naman day neutral, so, walang, uh, hindi siya nakadepende doon sa duration ng light. So, kung short day man or long day, yung uh, exposure niya sa light, so, it will flower pa rin. So, next is vernalization. So, ito naman yung uh, ay temperature-dependent phenomena kung saan 
yung flowering ay mapopromote kapag ang ating seeds ay uh, or plant is exposed to cold temperature. So, yung seeds are cooled during germination to accelerate flowering. Yeah. And then, we have uh, endogenous rhythm. So, dito, the endogenous rhythm, recurring events or oscillation with processes not directly reflecting environmental fluctuation. So, it is not really dependent on the uh, environmental condition. So, it could be annual, which reoccur every year. And pwede rin naman na lunar, which reoccur every new moon. Or pwede din naman na circadian, which recur every 24 hours. Oh, yan. And then, plant movement. So, yung plant movement, so, uh, may exhibit movement of some organs in response to environmental stimuli. So, yung ating uh, plants ay nag-move toward doon sa signal na kanilang nape-perceive. So, dito sa ating signal transduction pathway. So, sa reception, so, we have the receptor which will bind yung hormone dito sa ating receptor at uh, may pe-perceive yung signal. And then, uh, sa transduction, so yung signals na na-recept ay ma-amplify at convert to a chemical form para uh, ma ma produce kung ano man yung or ma-activate yung response. At uh, after no na ma-amplify na yung signals and then magkakaroon na tayo ng induction or uh, mapuproduce na yung response such yung activation of cellular responses so for tropic movement so itong mga tropic movements so yun yung uh, movement ng plant na uh, in depend dependent doon sa environmental stimulus or signals na kanilang na perceive or na -re recept so, marami tayong types ng tropic response. Una is the phototropism, which is yung movement ng plant in response to light. And this phototropism is also ay uh, dito, naapektuhan ng ox, ng ating uh, plant hormone na oxin. So, wait lang, inom, inom lang ako. So, as you can see dito sa ating uh, figure, so, yung uh, light dito, yan, nasa taas. Ito ay yung coleoptil tip. So, ito yung light. So, and makikita nyo yung mga dots-dots. So, yan yung oxygen concentration or oxygen molecule. So, kapag uh, unilateral yung distribution ng light, so, tuwid lang yung uh, ating uh, coleoptil tip. So, walang bending na nangyayari since uh, equally distributed yung oxin. So, pantay-pantay yung uh, pag-elongate. While, comparing dito sa pangalawa, yung light ay nandito lang sa kabilang side. So, yung light dito ay nandito tapos yung kabilang side ay uh, shaded. So, uh, meron tatlong hy hypothesis si oxin kung bakit uh, nagkakaroon ng uh, curvature uh, toward the light. So, pwede na si light, so, nai-inhibit niya yung uh, oxin production. So, pwedeng, dahil yan nga, kay light, na, na, uh, i-inhibit niya or napipigilan niya yung pag-produce uh, ng oxin. Or pwede din naman na dahil sa light, ay na ta-transport or nagmo-move yung oxygen laterally meaning pupunta siya doon sa shaded side nung uh, tips so yan so makikita nyo nag-move yung uh, oxygen molecules dito sa shaded side so kaya makikita nyo dito na mas naging increased yung cell elongation dito sa part na ito compared dito since uh, dito nga ay nawalan ng oxygen molecules. So, kaya nagkaroon ng 
cell elongation na mas increase dito compared dito. So, nag-bend toward the light yung uh, tips. So, yeah. So, yung ating uh, stems is positively or positive yung kanyang phototropic response sa light. While kapag naman yung ating roots, negative naman yung kanyang phototropism. Since pag roots away doon sa light yung kanyang uh, curve. Kasi ang oxin naman sa roots, kapag mas mataas ang concentration ng, ng oxin sa roots, mas uh, napipigilan naman yung elongation. Magkabaliktad sila. So sa stem, kapag increase ang concentration ng oxin, mas napopromote yung cell elongation. Pero sa roots, kapag uh, mas mataas yung uh, concentration ng oxin, uh, mas napipigilan naman yung pag-elongate ng cells. So, yun. And then, we have chemotropism, which is yung movement naman ng plants is in response to chemicals. So, for this example, sa uh, fertilization, so kapag ka yung ating uh, stigma nag-produce ng chemical, so yung uh, ating pollen tube will uh, move toward the ovule. So, yan. And then, ayun na. And then, uh, hydrotropism. So, ito naman yung movement ng uh, plant in response to water. So, yan. Dito sa figure na aking nakuha. So, yan. Makikita nyo, yung both uh, sides ay moist. So, walang, uh, kumbaga parang both ay ano, equal yung pag-elongate or paghaba noong uh, roots. Well, comparing dito na yung other side lang yung moist at yung other side ay dry. So, mas nag, uh, or nag-move yung uh, roots papunta doon sa uh, moist soil. Since nga, ba kailangan ng, ng halaman yung water. So, pupunta talaga siya kung saan may source ng water para doon ituloy yung kanyang uh, metabolic processes at mag-elongate. So yan. And then uh, we have geotropism which is the plant's response to gravity. So as you can see the stems and leaves have negative gravitropic response since uh, against the gravity pataas while the roots have positive geotropism geotropic response since yan, toward the gravity, yung movement ng roots. And then we have tigmotropism. So response naman ng ating plants to touch. So example of this ay yung mga plants na may tendrils. So yung tendrils, so, so yun yung thread-like structure ng plants, ng mga climbing plants. So for this example, yung orienting factor nitong mga uh, plants na ito is yung hard surfaces. So, kung may maramdaman sila na pwedeng pagkapitan na hard surfaces, so doon sila magmumove. So, yan. Kagaya niya. So, yan. And then, we have thermotropism. So, in response to temperature, so itong mga leaves na ito, ganito ang nangyayari kapag ka expose sila sa too hot temperature or too high temperature while ito namang mga itong daisy flower kapag ka naka-experience na ng too high temperature so ganyan nangyayari so <clears throat> next nastic movements so ano naman ang nastic movements so nastic movement is the move these movements are non-directional response to the stimuli. So, unlike doon sa ating tropic responses na direct, uh, directional to the environmental signal or stimuli, so yung mga nastic movements ay hindi ganun. So, movements are independent of the direction of the stimulus. So, hindi siya uh, kagaya ng uh, tropistic response nakapag andon yung uh, signal so doon sila nagmo-move so pag nastic movements independent yung kanyang uh, response and this movement can be due to changes in turgor or growth 
And basic movement is not a growth phenomenon. So, tandaan na hindi growth phenomenon si plastic movement. So, plastic movement. So, we have hyponasty or the bending up of leaves. So, this could be, hyponasty could be due to the, yung lower surface is mas mabilis yung pag-grow. So, kaya nagkakaroon ng hyponasty. While pag epinasty, yung bending of, bending down of leaves. So, bending due to inter, or determinate growth naman, yung epinasty. Kaya siya nag-bend down. And then, other is the hydronasty. Or yung pag-fold or pag-roll naman ng leaves in response to water. And then, next is the photonasty or yung uh, plant's response to light. So, uh, ito ay pwedeng dahil sa, sa response ng plant sa intensity ng light. So, example dito is itong uh, flower na ito which is during the day. Yan, open yung kanyang flower. Pero kapag ka night na, it closes. And next is the Niklinasty. So, movement at night or in the dark. Or pwede ding tawagin itong si Niklinasty as sleeping movement. And related siya, pwede din siyang uh, related doon kay Potonasty and Thermonasty since uh, affected siya by temperature and light intensity. So, for this uh, example, so tingnan nyo at uh, uh, during the day, so ganyan. So, kapag night, so nagko parang naka-close siya o parang natutulog na siya at night. Kaya sleeping uh, movement din yung pwedeng tawag kay Niklinas. So next is thermonasty which is uh, plant's response to temperature. So so for our example, so itong flower na to which is M. jalapa so, nagbubloom siya at late afternoon kapag yung temperature ay bumababa na. While yung mga tulip flowers naman nagbubloom at mid-morning kapag uh, mataas na yung temperature. So, yan. And then, sismonasty or tigmonasty. So, ito naman yung response ng plant to shock, con contact or vibration. So, best example is yung ating mimosa pudica. So, uh, kapag ka siya ay na-touch, so ganyan, nagko-close or nagpo-fold yung uh, leaves niya. So, yan. Yung sis monasty or tig monasty. So, I guess that's it. So, ayan. Tapos na yung aking uh, presentation or lecture. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, ma for your wonderful Thank you, po. Ayan, Thank you, if may katanungan tayo about kay ma'am, pwede ma na natin kita ng about plant growth Thank and you, the process. May tanong ba about about sa topic Yun. Feeling ko na intindihan naman na yung lahat, you know? Okay. Kung walang tanong, thinking... pwede bang can I use this time just to pray for all of them para sa kan Kailan pa board exam? Sa November pa po. November. Ah, November. Okay. 23, 24 I think. Okay. Somewhere. Okay, I'll just pray for them for oh, kahit two minutes. Okay. So God, thank you Lord okay, for pa. this opportunity to share yung knowledge sa kanila. Thank you for the opportunity to serve this mga youth and aspires to be a future agriculturist. Thank you, Lord, for their lives. And I pray na patuloy mo silang i-guide at gabayan sa uh, kanilang uh, board exam. I pray na uh, sa tuwing sila ay nakikinig or nagre-review as ay mas main, mas maintindihan nila mas maintindihan yeah, mas maintindihan nila and pumasok sa kanilang uh, puso at isip talaga kung ano yung inaaral nila and i pray na sa darating na board exam ay gabayan mo sila and alam ko na uh, 
hindi lang dahil sa nag-aral sila or masyado nilang pinuspos yung uh, pagre-review. Pero without you, ay hindi nila then makakaya na makapasa because ikaw lang din yung nagbibigay sa kanila ng source of strength and wisdom. And I pray na, uh, at ikiniklaim ko na lahat ng nandito ay makapasa sa board exam. And uh, yun, I pray na patuloy mo silang i-guide sa kanilang journey after nila mag-aral. And yun, thank you Lord for their lives. And I pray for the best to sa kanilang lahat. Thank you Lord. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you very much, Ma'am. Oh, ayan, may may lecture and prayer na tayo from Ma'am, di ba? So, if may katanungan, ngayon na po ang inyong panahon para itanong na ang mga queries ninyo. Kung may hindi kayo naintindihan about sa topic, yun. Hindi ko naman ay alam na nilang na. Thank you. I hope may naintindihan kayo. <clears throat> yes. If wala na, uh, na uh, we'll give our certificate of appreciation, ma'am. Same certificate is awarded to Miss Cheryl Bondalian. Certificate of Appreciation in recognition of her outstanding contribution as volunteer for sharing knowledge during Padayan Hiraya Manawari free layer review sessions on April 3, 2022. Signed by Rans Kadukoy, signed by Felix S. Valdez, and signed by Brian Angelo Sustrin. So, muli po, maraming 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 salamat po. Ayan, before daw po tayo mag- move sa next na uh, speaker we will have a photo photo op ayan so paganda open ng ating mga cameras para ayan salamat po opo ay picture lang po magpo yeah. ayan eh madami nag open ngayon tawi <laughs> picture na po ako One, two. Three. Isa pa po. One, two, three. Ayan. Okay na po. Maraming maraming salamat po. Yes po. Thank you po. Ayan. Thank you very much po ulit. Ayan, mag-stretching po muna tayo. Ayan. Stretching tayo ng one minute. One minute, water break, CR break. Yan. Ay, yung lumabas pala sa board exam, sa soil. Hindi ko naintindihan yun yung about sa soil tax. So. Some, somewhere na tinanong ko ano yung soil order, pero walang soil order na tama dun sa choices. Series. Huwag pala. Naka-recorded pala tayo. Joke lang pala. Parang ganun. So, so if yan, ready na tayo, let's move on for our last I think last yun, last uh, speaker for this afternoon so our speaker uh, ay nag-graduate na kanyang Bachelor of Science in Agriculture sa Laguna State Polytechnic University at nag at nagtapos din ang kanyang Masters ha, of of Science in Soil Science, Specialization in Soil Fertility sa, um, sa University of the Philippines, Los Baños. And uh, at present, he is doing his uh, doctors in Philosophy in Soil Science 
uh, specialization in soil fertility and cognitive and environmental science and community development. So, eh, yun lang, and postgraduate at University of Philippine Los Baños, uh, in nga po, Doctor of Philosophy again. And he's currently a uh, uh, faculty member of Southern Luzon State University. So let's welcome Sir Salvo Ocampo Salvacion. Ayan, from Tengayed, Pangasinan. Hello, po, Hello good afternoon. Good okay, <laughs> so good afternoon. Wait lang ah. Okay. Okay, wait lang po. Okay. And so good afternoon. I am Salvo, Salvation from Southern Luzon State University, Chang Campus. So let me share my screen. Ayan. Kita na po yung screen ko? Yes, sir. Kita na po, sir. Okay, so again, I am Salvo Salvation from Southern Luzon State University. And for this afternoon, I will be discussing um, a part, uh, a field of soil science, which is soil fertility. So yung discussion ko for this afternoon, usually ginagamit ko siya um, during my soil science class at saka kapag na-invite din ako na mag-review um, ng soil science, particularly soil fertility ng CBRC and um, LSP and SLSU. Ayan. So let us first define soil as a natural resource. Ano, so maybe may, may kanya-kanya tayong definition ng soils depende kung anong field natin. May yung iba, kung engineer sila, they just see soil na um, based for, the, for, for construction. Siyempre tayo as agriculture and future agriculturist. Um, as agriculturist and future agriculturist, um, we see soil as um, media for, for plant growth. And kung sa soil science talaga, you see soil as... Um, storage ng nutrients ng water para sa um, para sa growth ng ating halaman. So soils, soil was defined as in soil service staff in 1975 as the collection of natural bodies on earth's surface in places modified or even made by man or earthy materials containing living matter and supporting or capable of supporting plants out of doors. Soil includes the horizon near the surface that differ from the underlying rock material as a result of interactions through time of climate, living organism, parent materials, and relief. So as you can see, I um, nakabold yung mga words such as time, climate, living, living organism, parent materials, and relief because these are the functions or these are the factors that affect the formation of the soil. Okay, so at end, kung hindi ito yung unang discussion, na, discussion nyo with regards to soil science, and I know na discussion ni naman sa soil science subject, we have two approach in the study of soil. We have pedo pedology and apology. So, um, alam nyo na naman yung pinakaiba nun. So, we will discuss soil um, in in edafic fa as edafic factor sa, sa plant growth. Okay. So as soil fertility, it is defined as a field of soil science. So meron tayong dalawang definition ng soil fertility. It can be a field of soil science or the inherent capacity of the soil. So as field of soil science, it studies the status of a soil with respect to the form, amount, and availability of plants, nutrients, elements necessary for plant growth. So lahat ng um, kung available ba yung nutrients, kung um, ano yung mga nutrients na yun. Kasi syempre, we have elements, di ba? So, bakit hindi lahat ng elements in our periodic table ay hindi kasama as nutrients for, plant for, for plants? So, we will discuss that. We have certain rules of essentiality. And then, yung other definition of soil fertility is yung kakayahan ng lupa na magbigay ng um, tamang amounts of nutrients in proper amounts in right forms and um, in balance ratios, okay? 
So let us define this term. We have soil fertility and soil productivity. So this is also uh, with regards to our soil, syempre. So soil fertility is the ability of the soil to supply essential nutrients to plants in sufficient, amount, in sufficient and balanced amounts. And soil productivity is the ability of the soil to produce desired quantities of plant yield. So itong dalawang to is um, related, but they are not the same. So soil fertility is kung gano'ng karami ba yung nutrients that is present in the soil. Okay, but kung gaano karami, ano bang forms, tama ba yung amounts nila, hindi ba sila nagkakaroon ng antagonistic effects sa isa't isa, so that is soil fertility. In soil productivity, um, yung bang lupa kapag tanimman natin is nakakapag-produce ng marami or makaka-harvest ba tayo ng marami in that, in that particular soil. So not all fertile soil are productive and, and vice versa. Kasi baka mamaya mataas nga yung nutrient content content ng ating lupa. So it is fertile, but it is not productive kasi wala naman siyang tanim. Or pwede rin namang um, somehow it is productive kasi um, ang, ang kinukuha naman, ang, naka, ang nag-grow na halaman ay for example, grasses na kinukuha natin, kinakat-carry natin at pinapakain sa So it is productive, but pukunti naman yung nutrient na nandun sa lupa. So um, all, not all fertile soil are productive and vice versa. What can we say is a productive soil is necessary for yield. Ayan. So pwedeng, um, kung productive yung lupa natin, necessary na fertile siya, kaya, kaya nga siya nakapag-produce, kaya nag, nakapag-produce ng marami yung um, nakatanim na halaman doon is because na bibigay yung enough na nutrients. But not all fertile soil is productive. Okay? So another definition of terms in terms of soil fertility, we have plant nutrition and nutrients. So in terms of plant nutrition, it is the supply and absorption of chemical elements or compound required by the plants. So dito sa plant nutrition, kasama yung assimilation, translocation ng nutrients. So kung paano ba siya absorb ng halaman and saan siya gagamitin and um, paano siya nagka-translocate inside the plants. And nutrients, these are, these are the chemical elements or compounds required by plants for normal growth. Okay, so elements. Okay, pero not all elements are nutrients kasi there are elements that are not required by the plants for normal growth. Okay, so we have classification of nutrients. So we have based on the amount needed by the plants, we have macronutrients and micro. So by the uh, prefix na nilagay din sa nutrients, malalaman natin sila macro needed or elements needed relatively large amounts. So hindi naman porket mas maraming um, kailangan yung macronutrients compared kay micronutrients, mas mahalaga na si micronutrients as compared kay macro. They are both important. Um, mas marami lang na kailangan yung micronutrients and kukunti lang sa micronutrients. And for based on mobility, we have mobile and immobile. So mobile elements are those elements that can move around the plants and deficiency is manifested in old leaves. And the immobile elements are elements that are fixed in the one location and the symptoms of deficiency is shown first by younger leaves. So um, kapag magtitingin tayo ng deficiency symptoms, we can say kung ano ba yung element na, na nagkukulang based on kung saan ba nag, unang nag-manifest yung symptoms, kung sa, um, sa old leaves or sa young leaves. So kapag sa old leaves unang nag-manifest yung symptoms, um, pwede natin sabihin na yung element na yun na kulang is mobile and then um, pag younger leaves, those are immobile elements. So we have here the list of nutrients needed by plants and they're the ionic form. When we say ionic form, these are the available forms na kinukuha ng halaman. So hindi porket may nitrogen dyan, um, kukunin na siya ng halaman. Ano? So we have available, ionic, or the mineralized form. Okay, so we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So ito naman yung major elements na hindi naman na nakukulang sa halaman kasi it is available already. Carbon is available as, as carbon dioxide. Hydrogen is in water and oxygen can be um, sourced by O2, CO2, and H2O. So nitrogen is available as ammonium or nitrate. So NH4 plus or NO3 minus. Phosphorus, H2PO4 plus, minus, HPO4 plus, and PO4 minus, 2 minus. Potassium is available as K plus, sulfur as sulfites and sulfates, calcium as A2 plus, magnesium as MG2 plus, and we have the micronutrients such as iron, which is available as Fe2 plus. Some plants take Fe3 plus, manganese as 
Mn2+, plus, zinc, azinc 2+, plus, copper C2+, plus, boron BO3, 2 minus, molybdenum mas MOO4, 2 minus, and chlorine Cl minus. So, bakit ba na-consider itong mga elements as essential? So, as I said, we have three roles as essentiality na sinusunod. Okay? So, this rule first, plants cannot complete their life cycle in the absence or lack of any of the nutrient elements. So, once na nagkulang yung element na yun, hindi na magtutuloy yung life cycle or may magkukulang na, na um, stage in the life cycle of the plant. So, kapag, once na nangyari yun, we can say that that particular element is essential. Second, the nutrient is an integral part of the plant structure and they participate in one or more metabolic process in the plant. And the third one, no other element can substitute for that element if it is absent or lacking in supply. So, walang, walang um, paghalili. Ano? So, its deficiency can be corrected by addition of that element in question. Okay, so yon. Dapat kasama siya sa um, hindi magkukul, hindi magbubuo yung life cycle ng halaman kapag nawala siya. It is integral part of the plant or kasama sa metabolic processes and walang makakapag-substitute sa kanya. Okay, so yun yung um, three um, rules of essentiality. So we will now proceed to the functions of the nutrient elements in the plants. So first, we have nitrogen. Nitrogen is a constituent of amino acids, protein, and nucleic acid. And it is an integral part of the chlorophyll molecule and associated with photosynthetic activity, vigorous vegetative, vegetative growth, darkening color of leaves, and succulents of tissues. For phosphorus, um, it is for energy storage and transfer to ATP and ADP conversion. So yung pagkoconvert from ATP to ADP doon nag-release yung energy, particularly in the process of photosynthesis. Structural components of nucleic acid, coenzyme nucleotides, phosphoproteins, phospholipids, and sugar phosphates. It, and phosphorus involves in the metabolic processes such as photosynthesis, respiration, synthesis of proteins, phospholipids, nucleic acid, lipids, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, and pectin. For phosphorus, the import, it is important in seed formation and development of reproductive parts of plants. So it is associated with increased root growth, early maturity, particularly green development. And as you can see here, yung pag purple, that is a deficiency symptom of phosphorus. Yeah, so nitrogen deficiency symptom, um, siguro yellowing ng older leaves. For potassium, it is an enzyme activator. It regulates osmotic pressure in roots. Ayan, so kaya um, um, na pipigilan yung pagkatuyo ng halaman. Sabi nga, kapag mayroong enough na supply ng potassium, that can also inhibit um, drought dun sa um, halaman natin. It maintains regular pressure of guard cells and regulates opening of the stomates. So Kaya din napipigilan yung pagkatuyo ng halaman kasi nga aside sa namimaintain yung osmotic pressure sa ugat, namimaintain din ng potassium yung pag-opening ng stomates by regulating the pressure in the guard cells. It is needed in ATP synthesis which is used for translocation of sugars from leaves and uptake and protein synthesis. And strengthen the straw of grain crops and prolong the life of the flag leaf. This is and this is resistance. For calcium, it enhances NO3 and uptake and regulate cation uptake. Ayan. So, merong association si calcium at si NO3 sa pag-uptake kasi di ba calcium is being taken by the plants in CA2+. So, nakikarry niya itong nitrate kasi they have different charges. And then, it is essential for cell elongation and division and um, it is part of the cell wall in the form of calcium pectate. Ayan. And for magnesium, it's constitute of chlorophyll molecule and structural components in the ribosome which are associated with protein synthesis. It is also associated with energy transfer action from in a metabolic process like photosynthesis, glycolysis, DCAC cycle, and respiration. Okay. For sulfur, it is needed in synthesis of S-containing amino acids. So, hindi lang nitrogen yung, yung um, essential for for amino acid, but also sulfur because some amino acids contain sulfur. And it is needed in the synthesis of coenzyme A, biotine, thymine, and growth. And um, it is a component of a substance like S. Um, <clears throat> and 
um, it is required for CTCs of chlorophyll and vital part of ferrotoxin. And it occurs in the volatile compounds responsible for the characteristic taste and smell of mustard and onion, and sometimes also in garlic. Yeah. So role naman ng micronutrients, we have boron. So boron is somewhat uncertain, but believe important in sugar translocation and carbohydrate metabolism. For iron, um, for chlorophyll synthesis, and in enzyme for electron transfer. And for manganese, it controls several oxidation reduction system and the formation of O2 in photosynthesis. For copper, it is a catalyst for respiration and enzyme constituent. And for zinc, it is an, an enzyme system that regulates various metabolic activities. And for molybdenum, it is needed in nitrogenase formation, which is an enzyme that is needed for nitrogen fixation. And then for cobalt, it is also essential for symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Chlorine is an activate system for production of O2 in photosynthesis. Yeah, so those are the elements and their roles in the plants. So now let's proceed to nutrient absorption. So there are three mechanisms in nutrient absorption. The first one is the mass flow, where in movement of nutrients to the roots due to the uptake and transpiration of water. So particularly in mass flow, um, yung nutrients sumasama sa tubig para, and yung water, di ba, mag-uptake siya ng roots by means of transpiration. And then, eh, ma-uptake siya ng roots and it will move in the plants in the form, in kasabay sa transpiration. So um, that is how mass flow ay... Um, nutrients absorbed by means of mass flow. So, basta ang laging natandaan with mass flow is water. Okay. For diffusion, diffusion is the movement of nutrients ion from a zone of high concentration. So, kapag um, diffusion, um, ang movement naman is through um, zone of concentration. Ano, from low to higher, from higher to low concentration. Ayan. So, di ba, in the root system, in the rhizosphere, syempre, una na ubos yung nutrients inside or yung sakop nung, nung rhizosphere or kung saan, kung saan yung naabot ng ugat. And dun unang mauubos yung nutrients kasi siya yung naabot ng ugat. So, yung mga pag-move ng nutrients from higher concentration na malayo dun sa roots, papunta dun sa ugat, that can be also associated to diffusion. Okay? And then the last one, um, the mechanism is the mechanism of root interception. Okay? For root interception, it is what we call as the contact exchange wherein there is a direct um, a direct um, association between the root and the collagen surface na kung saan nakatouch yung nutrients. So kailangan na mismong yung ugat, yung dumikit dun sa root surface, yung dun sa surface ng lupa para makuha niya yung nutrients. So um, majority yung mga immobile elements yung um, nakukuha by root interception. Okay. So nutrient absorption can be divided into two, the passive aptic and active aptic. So for passive aptic, it occurs in the outer or apparent free space consisting of the walls of the epithermal and cortical cells of the roots. And uptake is by diffusion and ion exchange, thus concentration and electrical gradient. So passive uptake is non-selective and do not require energy for metabolic reactions in the cells. So this yun yung major na difference between passive and uptake and active uptake. So passive uptake, um, it does not require energy. I know. So the plants do not require to um, exert energy para makuha niya yung, absorb niya yung um, nutrients. But for active, kailangan mag-release um, mag, ng energy ng halaman para makuha niya yung nutrients. So passive uptake occurs outside the Casparian strip and plasma, plasma lamella and as a barrier to diffusion and ion exchange. For active uptake, it is transport of ions into the inner cells that require energy due to the higher concentration of ions beyond the plasma lamina and into the cytoplasm, which is against an electrochemical gradient. Ayan. So this is, um, ang nutrients kasi is against the, the electrochemical gradient. So there is a need to um, require, there is a need to release of energy. Okay. So the process is selective in that specific ions are transported by specific carriers. Okay. So a uh, uh, passive and active update. So now let's proceed to the causes of decline in soil fertility. 
Okay, so these are the ways by which nutrients are lost or converted into an available form in the soil. So yung major naman na pagko-convert, di ba? We have mineralization, which is the conversion of available form or unavailable form to available form. Yung kabalik tara naman nun is immobilization. So other than that, there are other um, means kung bakit bumababa yung soil fertility status. So the first one is the crop removal. Okay. So crop removal, this is absorption of soil by plants. Actually, ito yung um, natatanging cost ng decline in soil fertility na I think is okay naman. Kasi at least bakaya bumaba yung fertility status kasi nakuha siya ng halangan. And eventually, nag, nag, napunta siya sa, sa yield ng halaman. Okay. So that is crop removal. And then the next one is leaching. So this is the removal of nutrient elements through the downward movement of water. So kapag um, nakasamang nag-move yung water from a higher horizon to lower horizons, so nakasama yung nutrients, so that is leaching. So although hindi siya nawawala talaga sa lupa, but nawawala kasi siya kung saan yung zone ng ugat na kung saan yun lang inaabot ng ugat para makakuha ng nutrients. So dahil nawala siya dun sa zone na yun at mas lumalim pa siya, So, it is considered as cause of decline in soil fertility. Okay? The next one is erosion. So, this is loss of particles and hence nutrients with the action of wind. So, hindi lang wind but also water or other uh, means of erosion. So, basta erosion, nadala nga yung lupa. Eh. So, particularly, yung mga, part, yung mga lupa na yun that contain nutrients. So, siya din naging another effect niya is bumaba din yung fertility status ng lupa. Next is volatilization. It is escape of nitrogen from the soil as ammonia gas. So this is the conversion of um, NH4 plus to so NH3 and then hanggang sa magvolatilize siya. So bakit ba nangyayari yun? Um, mga, 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 mga factors na nag-favor for volatilization is first, kung masyadong mababa yung pH ng lupa natin. So acidic condition, nag-favor siya ng volatilization. The next one is high temperature and Um, yung hindi natin pagdi-deplacement ng mga fertilizer. Ayan. Di ba yung iba sanay na nagsasabog lang ng fertilizer, particularly mga nitrogenous fertilizer. So kapag nainitan yan, matutunaw, and then yung nitrogen that is in there can, will be transport, transformed into NH3 and then it will volatilize or um, mag-escape in our atmosphere. Next one is denitrification. So denitrification is the conversion of nitrates to nitrogen gas oxides of nitrogen, especially in poorly drained soil. So um, from NH4 plus and then hanggang sa um, NH4 plus kasi to NO3 is nitrification. Eh. And then from, nitrif from, nit from NO3, isa mo, konti konti na maawala yung oxygen. So NO3 maging NO2 hanggang sa maging... Um, NO and 2O hanggang N2 na lang. So kapag N2, yan na yung ultimate na unavailable for plant kasi it is in the form of gas na. So mawawala na siya for plant uptake. So it will also yield to loss of soil fertility or decline in soil fertility. Next is immobilization. So ito na yung kabalikaran ng mineralization kasi di ba yung kanina mga nabanggit natin, um, yung mga... Um, form, mga ionic forms, yun yung mga mineralized forms. And once na, na immobilized na sila, so na-change na sila from available, naging unavailable ulit sila. So paano ba nangyayari yun? So pwedeng na-change lang talaga yung kanilang um, forms o kaya naman pwedeng na na-trap na sila in a clay particle kaya siya naging immobilized. Like potassium, kapag na-entrap siya sa, um, sa twist to one type na clay, particular e light so hindi na siya nakakalabas so um it renders emo, um unavailable for plant uptake and then some um halimbawa nitrogen nakuha ng um, bacteria um yun hindi available yung nitrogen for plant uptake maliban na lang kung ilabas ulit siya ng bacteria or um yung nakakuha ng bacteria sa kanya ay fixer yan so pwede na ulit siyang maging available for plants. And that is mineralization na. And the, and the last one is the fixation. It is the conversion of unavailable form into soluble or unavailable form such as phosphate and potassium fixation. So ito yung isa sa napapansin ko na uh, mistake with regards to 
um, fixation. Ano, laging akala ng mga um, agriculturist or agriculture students or mga students in agriculture ay basta fixation, it is good. Kasi nitrogen nga, di ba? Nafi-fix para maging available. No. Um, nitrogen lang yung na-fix na or nag-undergo ng fixation na naging available. But other element less such as post potassium, phosphorus, pag nag-undergo sila ng fixation, it is now unavailable kasi na-fix na sila. So nutrients fixed with the soil are not necessary lost from the soil unless removed through the erosion but their availability to plants is reduced. So na-fix kasi sila or na-attach into a clay particle. Ayan. So fixation. Okay? So yun siguro yung isang um, dapat nililinaw natin. When it, when it comes to fixation. Nitrogen fixation, that is okay, but other fixation, um, it renders the nutrient unavailable. Okay? So we have some types of fixation. We have phosphorus fixation. It, where it is where ENP is in the form of orthophosphate ions are very active in the soil. Under slowly acidic soil condition, these ions react with aluminum and iron ions, forming relatively insoluble aluminum phosphate eh, or and iron phosphate compounds. Ayan. So we have, for example, we have H2PO4- and HPO4-. So these are available forms na. But kapag naging sobrang acidic ng lupa natin, maraming aluminum and iron compounds. So, pwedeng makipag-form um, ng insoluble um, insoluble compounds yung aluminum sa phosphorus or iron sa phosphorus kaya hindi na nagiging available si phosphorus. And kapag naman sobrang taas ang pH, so there are um, higher concentration of calcium ions, so it will form insoluble compound to with, with phosphorus. So magbubuo yung CA, CAP compound. So that is also unavailable for. So mapataas or mapababa yung pH, phosphorus can be unavailable due to fixation. Kapag low pH, it can fix with aluminum and iron. And kapag mataas naman yung pH, it can form um, insoluble compound with calcium. Okay? Another fixation is the zinc ion fixation. So zinc ions precipitated at zinc OH reducing its availability to plants when the soil is overlined. So kapag naglalime tayo, di ba, um, there is the release of OH or, or OH, or OH and it will um, precipitate with zinc. So kapag na zinc na, na fix na si zinc with OH, it is not it is now unavailable for plant uptake. Ammonium ion fixation by less expanding to east one place like vermiculite reducing its, avail its availability to plants. So, ayun. Yun yung mga um, fixation na not so good for, uh, for us na hindi, na hindi nag-favor sa atin para maging available yung mga nutrients. Okay? Next is the concepts of availability. availability. So availability refers to the relative ease in which nutrient is supplied by the soil. It depends on two factors such as intensity and capacity factor. So what is the difference between intensity and capacity factor? So intensity factor is essentially the concentration of nutrients in the soil solution. So in, dense, diba, in our soil, we have soil solution and we have the soil particles. Okay, yung concentration ng nutrients sa soil solution, that is the intensity factor. And the capacity factor, ayan, yun yung na dun sa soil, nasa soil particle. So it is the ability of the soil to replenish the amount of nutrients in the soil solution which are absorbed by plants from the solid phase. Okay, so for example, um, yun nga, yung nutrients natin that are available in the that are present in the soil solution, yun yung intensity factor, yun yung readily available para sa absorption ng halaman. And the capacity factor, once na naubos na yung nutrients dun sa soil solution, um, magre-release itong nasa solid phase and that is the capacity factor. Okay? I hope that's clear. So... The intensity factor, these nutrients may be derived by weathering of rocks and minerals, decomposition of organic matter, deposition from atmosphere, and application of fertilizer material. So ito yung mga pinanggagalingan ng mga nutrients in the intensity factor. Okay? So examples, NO3- and CL- are very soluble and generally do not form insoluble compounds with any soil constituents and other nutrients. So NO3 and CL- are only present in the um, in the water or in the soil solution. So na dun siya sa intensity factor. And then SO4 minus tend to be absorbed by strongly acidic soils, high aluminum, and 
iron. And copper and zinc form complexes with organic matter. Aluminum and iron form insoluble hydroxides and hydrous oxides. And P reacts with aluminum and iron in acidic soils and reacts with calcium and alkaline soils or recently lime soils. So ito yung um, nangyayari sa ating mga nutrients um, in the intensity factor. Okay. For the capacity factor categories, these those forms which are in rapid equilibrium with the soil solution. So ito nga yung mga nutrients in the soil solids. So those form which are in moderate to slow equilibrium with the soil solution, so example are the fixed K and absorbed P. So those form which are not in equilibrium with the soil solution because of the absence of a reverse reactions. So nutrients are released but not reabsorb. So the release of NPS, calcium, magnesium by OM, decomposition. Ayan. So once na nag-release yung ating solid, um, soil solids na mga nutrients, yun na yung sa capacity factor natin ma makaklassify. Okay? So what are the factors affect affecting the concentration of nutrients in the soil solution? So ano ba yung mga factors na nakaka-apekto kung bakit nagiging available yung concentration ng nutrients natin in the soil solution. So the first one is the soil pH. So we all know that it is a master property of the soil kasi di ba once we know soil pH, once we know na once we know the pH of the soil, we can tell a lot to the soil. We can tell kung siya ba acidic, alkaline or masasabi natin siya, masasabi din natin kung ano may mga elements available sa kanya. So, it is an important factor determining the solubility of the elements which tend to equilibrate with the soil solid. So, hydroxides of iron and aluminum are insoluble at high pH and soluble, soluble at low pH. Carbonates are insoluble at high pH. So, <clears throat> iron, basta tatandaan nyo, iron and aluminum at low pH siya soluble. So, insoluble siya at high pH. Carbonates naman or calcium, um, actually this is soluble at high pH. Okay. So redox potential is also one of the factors affecting the concentration of nutrients. So it is the state of aeration of the soil. So kapag kasi nagiging aerobic yung condition, wala na oxygen na ginagamit yung ating mga um, microbes para for respiration. So gumagamit na sila ng other elements. Okay. So for nutrient mobility, so nasabi na natin yung difference between mobile nutrients and immobile nutrients. So these are the mobile nutrients in the soil. So particularly ito yung na present in the intensity factor or in the soil solution, NO3 and Cl, and the, the immobile nutrients we have P as H2PO4 minus and HPO4 2 minus and K plus. So we have two root sorption zones. So these are the zones in the rhizosphere where plant roots absorb nutrients. So we have root surface sorption zone and root system sorption zone. When we say root surface sorption zone, which is, this is a thin layer of soil surrounding the root hair where plants absorb immobile nutrients. And kapag naman root system, it is a volume. Okay, so yun yung unang pagkakaiba. So root surface is a thin layer of soil. So soil. Um, root system sorption zone naman is a volume of soil. So both surrounding, so dito naman sa root system ay root system of the plants where mobile nutrients are absorbed. So mobile nutrients yun absorbed in the root system, so sorption zone, and immobile sa root surface sorption zone. Okay, so plant computation in the absorption of mobile and immobile nutrients. So when plants are far apart and root system do not overlap or interpenetrate, there is no computation in the absorption of mobile nutrients. So kung maayos yung planning distance nila, hindi sila nag-overlap at nagiging maayos or walang computation between the absorption of mobile nutrients. But when root system interpenetrate, there is a computation in the absorption of mobile nutrients. If the root surface sorption zone overlap, there is a competition in the absorption of immobile nutrients. So that is how um, computation between um, computation of mo in mobile and immobile nutrients occur. So let's let us now proceed to fertilizer and fertilizer competition. Of course, we cannot um dito, we cannot um di natin pwedeng paghiwalayin ano yung fertilizer and fertilizer competition in soil fertility kasi once na replenish yung fertility yung soil fertility we tend to add fertilizers and kung paano ba natin i-add yung mga fertilizers na yon gaano karami ang i-add natin na fertilizers so we must know the um 
the fertilizer itself and of course the kung paano natin kung gaano karami ba yung nutrient nating i-apply. Okay? So let us first define fertilizer. So fertilizer is any organic or inorganic material which contains one or more of the essential nutrients for plant growth. So we have organic fertilizer and inorganic fertilizers. So organic fertilizers are those derived from plant and or animals. And inorganic fertilizer are synthesized or are processed from mineral deposits. So remember, organic fertilizer dapat siya ay plant or animal based. Okay. According to sa PNS natin, um, Philippine National Standards on Organic Fertilizer or Organic Amendments or Amendments, uh, merong certain na uh, um, submission of NPK para makonsider siya as certified organic fertilizer. I think before is 5 to 10 percent, but now parang 5 to 12 percent na. I just not sure. So you can check on that sa Philippine National Standards. So you must synthesize processed mineral deposits. So those are inorganic fertilizers. Okay. So organic fertilizer, naturally to yung animal manures, compost, crop residues, and green, and green manures. In organic fertilizer naman, this contain one or more combination of the three primary elements. So we have um, NPK. So um, based dun sa presence ng three primary elements, nakaklassify natin yung inorganic fertilizer into single element compound fertilizer and complete fertilizer. If it only contain one element, that is a single fertilizer. One element in the three primary elements. Kasi merong mga fertilizer na merong pang additional na elements like ammonium sulfate. So meron siyang nitrogen and then meron pa siyang sulfur. It is still considered a single element fertilizer kasi isa lang naman dun sa tatlong primary element yung meron siya, okay, which is nitrogen only. So it is not considered as compound fertilizer kahit na meron siyang dalawang element pero yung isa namang element niya ay not primary. Okay? So compound fertilizer, those fertilizer that contain two or more elements among the NPK, and complete fertilizer containing all three, which are the N, D, and K. So conventional units of expressing fertilizer nutrients. So we have stated in their pure or oxide form. So nitrogen is expressed as pure element N. So yun nakikita natin dun sa um, fertilizer bags. So the N is the pure element N. P and K are present in oxide, so they are present as P2O5 and K2O. So the nutrient content of the fertilizer is written as percent N, percent P2O5, and percent k So remember, among the three elements or primary elements na nakasulat sa fertilizer, yung N lang yung pure element, and then P and K are present in oxide form. And yung... Um, Nakikita natin na label in the fertilizer, yung tatlong number na yan, 4500, so that is the fertilizer grade, which indicates present N, present P2O5, and present K2O, na kilogram. Okay? So example is among sulfate, which is 2100. So aside from categorizing um, inorganic fertilizer into complete compound and single element, we can also categorize them as nitrogen as based on the element na meron sila. So we can categorize them into nitrogen fertilizer, phosphorus, or potassium fertilizer. So in the nitrogen fertilizer, we have ammonium sulfate, urea, and anhydrous ammonia. So ammonium sulfate, there are 2000-2100 that has that contain 24% of sulfur. Okay, so um, kung ang dupa natin ay kulang sa nitrogen and also kulang din siya ng sulfur, so we tend to apply ammonium sulfate compared to urea. Meron niya mga fertilizer recommendations na kahit kulang, kahit hindi naman siya kulang sa sulfur but the soil is slight, uh, medyo mataas na yung pH, so ammonium sulfate talaga yung kinoconsider na fertilizer rather than urea. Okay, pero kapag naman acidic na yung lupa, we must not use ammonium sulfate but urea na lang. Bakit? Kasi bawat fertilizer may kanya-kanyang acidifying effect. And mataas yung acidifying effect ni ammonium sulfate as compared kay ammonia. Okay, kay ammonium as compared kay urea. Okay? So urea is 4500. It has highest end content among solid and fertilizer. Remember, solid. Okay, kasi among the nitrogen fertilizer, ang pinakamataas talaga ng content grade of N is anhydrous ammonia which is 82%. But this anhydrous ammonia is in the form of gas. 
Okay, kaya in the um, solid fertilizer na may mataas na N content, that is urea. And anhydrous ammonia, which, is, which, is, which has 82% of N, this has the highest amount of N among all fertilizer. It contained as pressure tanks and is usually custom applied by injecting into the soil. And ammonia gas is basic pudent N. Yeah, so that is for nitrogen fertilizer. For P fertilizer, we have OSP or ordinary superphosphate or NTSP or triple superphosphate. So OSP contains 20% P2O5. Okay. So triple superphosphate, wala na ako masyadong nakikita. And um, kapag phosphorus kasi yung kulang usually ang ina-apply na talaga is complete kasi once ako lang ng P, um, they tend to add K then. Ayan. So, we apply complete fertilizer. Next is the K fertilizer. The, sa pinakang common is the molate of potash or potassium chloride, TCL, which is highly soluble and contain traces of other elements. So, fertilizer grade of molate of potash, I think, is 0, 0, 60. Okay. Compound fertilizer, yan yung may dalawa. So, we have NP fertilizer, such as ammonium phosphate, may, ammonium, may nitrogen and then may phosphate, and then monoammonium phosphate. So ammonium phosphate sulfate contains 16, 20, 0, 20, 0. And then mono ammonium phosphate fertilizer gate is 11, 48, 0. For complete fertilizers, so these are these contain all the three primary fertilizers. Okay, pinahang common natin is in triple 14 or the 14, 14, 14. Okay. So, in terms of fertilizer application, we have different mode of fertilizer application. The most common one is the broadcast, which is spreading uniformly over the over the soil surface. So, so pasapog, yung tawag ng iba. Next one is the band placement, which is this um, fertilizer being spread on the narrow strip along the side of the row of the plants. Next is in the row, or fertilizer applied along the bottom of furrow. Ring. Applied around the base of the planter tree, hole, drop in holes around the trees, and spot, drop in small amount on the side of each hill or plant. Basal, so it's the first of fertilizer applied at the planting time. So kapag basal, yun kasing mga kanina, yan yung spot, hole, ring, broadcast, um, yun ay kung saan nilagay. But this, but this itong basal top dress, kung kailan, okay? So basal is... Um, tawag dung iba patungtong sa Tagalog. So ito yung unang fertilizer application. Okay? Kapag inorganic fertilizer, usually in-apply siya day before or on the day of the planting. Kapag naman mga, inorgan mga organic fertilizer, a month or two weeks before planting. Kasi bakit ganun, kailangan mo munang ma-mineralize yung mga um, nutrient na meron dun sa organic fertilizer. Kasi remember, yung mga, mga nutrients, kailangan mo na siyang um, in available form para makuha ng halaman. Okay? Next is top dress. This is the application sometime after plants have emerged. And then we have foliar. This is spraying of fertilizer on leaves. Fertigation, application of fertilizer dissolved in irrigation water. So what are the considerations in choosing the method of fertilizer application? First one is the relative mobility of nutrients in the soil. So kung mobile ba yung nutrients na meron sa fertilizer na yun, so we must consider that. The type of crop and its rooting pattern, soil texture, seasons of the year, and kind of fertilizer. Of course, the type of crop and its rooting pattern, so dapat alam natin kung deep-rooted ba siya or shallow-rooted kasi baka mamaya shallow-rooted siya pero sobrang nga rin yung pag natin ng fertilizer, so we must consider that. Okay? Soil texture, um, kung sandy, um, mas okay na dapat Split application kasi mabilis mag-glitch kapag sandy, kapag clay naman, yun, mas mababa yung um, occurrence ng leaching. Seasons of the year and kind of fertilizer. So now, um, we will um, discuss fertilizer computation. Medyo mabilis lang na discussion when it comes to fertilizer computation. So, masabi nyo, sir, kailangan ba talaga namin alam yung fertilizer computation? Baka wala naman sa board exam. Actually, nung nag-board ako, back in 2000 13, so medyo matagal na. Um, parang dalawa lang yung problems when it comes to fertilizer computation. Pero at least I know kung paano computein kasi baka mamaya yun na lang palang dalawang items na yun yung magpapapasa sa akin. So kailangan, alam nyo din. Ano? So for fertilizer computations, meron tayong dalawang 
formula na kailangang alalahanin. So, depende kung ano bang ang hinahanap. Kung bang weight of fertilizer or weight of nutrients. Or dami ng nutrients sa meron doon sa fertilizer. Kapag weight of fertilizer, we can use this. Weight of nutrient divided by nutrient content or um, recommendation. Ayan. Recommendation na nutrient divided by the nutrient content of the fertilizer or the fertilizer grid. And kapag naman dami ng nutrient, halimbawa gano, kara, ilang kilong nitrogen, ilang kilong phosphorus, ilang kilong potassium, we can use multiplication. So, i-multiply nyo lang yung dami ng fertilizer multiplied to its fertilizer grade. Okay? So, we have some sample problem. The first one. So, one nutrient element is recommended. We have 4500. So, how many kilograms of urea is needed? So, um, Pwede yung urea at saka pwede rin among yung sulfate. So, ang recommendation natin is 4500. So, kapag gumamit ba ng urea at saka kapag gumamit ng among yung sulfate, gano'ng karami yung kakailanganin. So, that is only... Um, the answer is 100 kg of urea or 214.29 kg of ammonium sulfate. So, how do we do that? 45 na recommendation divided by 0.45 which is the fertilizer grade of urea. So, bakit 0.45? We all know that this is percent N. So, 45%. So, 0.45. Yan. 45 divided by 0.45 para sa urea and para sa ammonium sulfate is 45 divided by 0.21. Para masurin nyo, kung meron ba talagang 45 kg to ng Itong AS ay meron talagang 45 kg of nitrogen. You try 214.29 times 0.21 or 100 times 0.45, we get 45 kg of nitrogen. Okay? For case 2, two nutrient elements are needed. Okay, so determine the weights of AS, which is 20.00, and AP, 16.20, needed to satisfy, satisfy the fertilizer recommendation of 90.30. So for this um, problem, um, kailangan muna natin i-consider yung mas mababang amount na recommendation. So we have 90 na N, 30 na P, and then 0 na K. So um, hindi, naman natin, hindi na natin problem yung K, kaya hindi disregard din natin siya. So the next... The best one is the 30, ano, 30 na phosphorus. So hanapin natin yung fertilizer na may phosphorus. So AS and AP yung meron tayo. So AP contain phosphorus. So we have 30 and 20. Okay? So 30 divided by 0.20, that is for, um, wait lang. Mag-ano nga tayo. Magkita tayo ng calculator para mas madali. Ano pa pala yung nakikita? Ano lang? Buong screen ko ba yung nag-show or yung presentation lang? Sorry. Ano po ba yung nakikita nyo? Yung presentation lang or yung buong screen? Yung presentation. Uh, buong screen. Okay. Sige. So... Yung, sinasa, yung kanina, sa computation natin ng AP, so una na, unahin natin computein yung AP kesa dun sa AS kasi ang una natin i-consider is yung mas mababa yung recommendation. So 30 divided by 0.20. Why 0.20? Kasi, but hindi 0.16? Kasi yung 16 is nitrogen, we are looking for phosphorus. So we have 150. Okay, so that is 150 of the AP. Pero dun sa AP na in-apply natin, hindi lang phosphorus yung meron, meron din siyang nitrogen na 16%. So, para malaman natin ilan bang nitrogen meron dun sa 150 kilograms of AP, so we can multiply 150 by 0.16. So, in the 150 kilograms of AP, meron na tayong 24% na nitrogen. Okay? E ilan ba yung total na nitrogen na kailangan natin? 90. So, 90 minus 24 is 66. So, 66 na lang yung recommended na nitrogen na kailangan natin. Okay? Hindi na yung buong 90. Bakit? Kasi na nag-apply ka ng EP, hindi lang phosphorus yung na-satisfy mo. You also satisfy nitrogen. Okay? So, oh, you also, ni mo na-satisfy pala. Meron ka rin nalagay na nitrogen. So, we have 66. So, ito na yung bago nating recommendation for nitrogen, 66. Okay? So, 66... The new recommended nitrogen divided by yung nitrogen na meron tayo, which is AS na 
20% ni nitrogen. So, 66 divided by 0.20, we have 330. So, kaya ang fertilizer na kailangan natin is AP, which is 150 kilograms, and AS na 330. Okay? I hope nakuha po yun. Nakuha po. Nakuha po yan? Okay. Sir, pa ulit para sir po. Okay, again. So for um, recommendation at 90-30-0, una natin ito consider na nutrient is yung may lowest na recommendation, so which that is 30. And then uh, ito consider natin na fertilizer ay yung fertilizer that also contains the nutrient. So P yung 30, so dapat yung may P din. So uh, between AS and AP, yung AP yung meron. Gano'n karaming phosphorus meron siya? Ilang percent? So 20%. So we have 30 na recommended na P divided by 0.20 na, um, na fertilizer grade na phosphorus ng AP. So that is 150. So we will apply 150 kilograms of AP. Doon sa AP na yon hindi lang phosphorus yung meron siya, meron din siyang nitrogen. Ilang percent na nitrogen? 16. So ilang kilograms yung nitrogen na yon So 150 times 0.16. So we get 24. So nung nag-apply tayo ng 150 kilograms ng AP, makapag-apply na tayo ng 30 na P and 24 na N. E ilan ba yung kulang natin? Ilan ba yung N na kailangan? 90. So we multiply, we subtract 24 from 90. So we have 66. So 66 pa yung kailangan nating nitrogen na isatisfy. So anong gagamitin nating fertilizer para masatisfy yung nitrogen na 66? So we have AS. So we divide it by 0.20 na fertilizer grade ng AS. So we have 330. So AP, we need 150 kg of it per hectare and AS 330 kg per hectare. Okay? Maliwanag na? Okay na po. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, I think next is three nutrient elements. So, we have fertilizer recommendation is 90, 30, 30, 30. So, um, so, unahin lang ulit natin to. Yung P and K. So, dahil isa lang naman yon. So, 30 na lang. So, 30 divided by 0.14. I think that is 214. So, gano'ng karaming um, N yung nalagay natin dun sa 214 na complete fertilizer. So, for, ano din, 30 din. So, 90 minus 30, 60. So, 60 divided by 0.20, we have 300 kilograms of IAS. Kaya, um, ang answer natin dito is 214 kilograms of complete fertilizer and 300 kilograms of AS. Ayan. So, you can, ano, you can screen cap para ha, maggamit nyo na um, mag-solve in your own. And then, for the activity, kung face-to-face sana, magkakandak tayo nito activity, but I will just leaving it here. Okay? So, the fertilizer recommendation was 120-60-30. So, using murit of potash, so SP and urea, na ito yung fertilizer grade. Murit of potash is 0060, OSP 020, and urea is 42600. Gano karami itong mga to. So by this, yung mga given na fertilizer naman ay um, mga single element lang, kaya madali lang siya. Ano, so for para computein natin yung murit of potash, gamitin lang natin yung 30. So 30 divided by 0.60. Para makompute natin yung OSP, yung 60 divided by 0.20. Kasi be sure na yung nutrient na kinoconsider nyo ay yun din yung fertilizer. Ano? So hindi natin pwedeng gamitin si urea para computing yung 30. Kasi 30 is for P. Urea ang contain niya ay nitrogen. Okay? So for urea, we use 120 divided by 0.46. Okay? I hope that's clear. And... Um, Doble pala yan. Okay. So, committee nyo na lang. Ito naman, the next activity, um, same recommendation, 120, 60, um, Ang gagamitin naman natin is complete fertilizer, AP and urea. Ito medyo complicated kasi nga, um, 
compound fertilizer unang given or complete fertilizer and then we have compound and then urea. Sige nga, so solve na natin isa-isa. Okay. So for the first one <laughs> na yung gagamit ng Kita pa yung calcu? Kita naman po yung calcu? Okay. So for this one, para makuha natin MP or Murit of Potash, 30 divided by 0.60. So the Murit Potash needed is 50 kilograms. Okay. And then for OST, we have 60 divided by 0.20. So we have 300 kilogram of OSP and for urea, we will use 120 divided by 0.46. So we will have 260.87 kilograms of urea. And for the next problem, this one, oh wait. So for this, dahil um, compound na, so una natin gagamitin ulit is yung pinakamababang recommendation which is 30 divided by yung syempre yung fertilizer na merong nutrient na yun. So this is phosphor, this is potassium. So alin ba yung fertilizer, among the three fertilizer, alin yung may potassium. So we have complete fertilizer. So 30 divided by 0.14. So we will be needing... Um, 214.29 kilograms of complete fertilizer. Okay? So, dun sa complete fertilizer na nilagay natin, hindi lang P, o hindi lang K yung meron, meron din siyang N at saka, at saka P. So, gano'ng karami? I think that is 30. Kasi 214.29 times 0.14, that is 30. So, para makuha natin yung um, new recommendation, we will subtract um, 30 dun sa tatlo. So 120 minus 30, we will have 90 kilograms of nitrogen na lang yung kailangan. And 60 minus 30, we will have 30 kilograms of um, phosphorus na lang na kailangan. So next na natin compute is the phosphorus. So we have, we have 30 divided by, alin yung may phosphorus na fertilizer, the AP divided, so we have 0.20. So we will be needing 150 kilograms of AP. Okay. Yung sa 150 kilograms na AP, ng AP, hindi lang phosphorus yung meron, but meron din siyang nitrogen. Gano'ng karami, we will compute. So times 0.16, we have 24. So 90 minus 24, bakit 90? Kasi yun na lang yung recommended ng nitrogen. 90 minus 24, we have 66 again. Then 66, divide natin siya sa 0. 0.46, the fertilizer grade ng urea na given. So we have, sorry, we have uh, 143.48 na urea yung kailangan. So yun yung amount ng tatlong fertilizer needed. Okay? And for the next problem, I believe this is um, per hill. So kapag per hill na yung recommend, yung kailangan, kailangan nyo lang kunin kung gaano karami bang halaman ang nakatanim. Okay? So, the fertilizer recommendation for tomato was 120, 120, 120. So, isang fertilizer lang yung kailangan nyo complete complete fertilizer. So, gaano karami yung kailangan per hill? The plants were spaced at 40 cm by 40 cm. So, para malaman natin kung gaano karaming fertilizer, kung gaano karaming halaman yung nakatanim dun sa isang hektarya. So, we have point 40 times 0.40, we have 0.16, so 10,000 square meter, sorry, 10,000 lang, <laughs> divided by 0.16, we have 62,500 na kamatis na nakatanim sa isang hektarya. So this is hypothetical question, ano? 62,500 yung nakatanim, gano ba karaming fertilizer yung kailangan? So we have 120 divided by 0.14. So this one, kung isang hektarya, ang nakatanim natin is 62,500. So kailangan lang ng 0 0.013 na um, kilogram. So times natin siya sa 1,000 para maging grams. 
So each hill need 13.71 grams of fertilizer. Yeah, so yun yung pag-compute kapag um, per hill yung kailangan. Okay? So yeah, so first calculate the amount of fertilizer needed per hectare. So we have 857. Then next compute for the number of hills. So 10,000 divided by 0 .40, 0 0.40 times 0 0.40. So we have 62,500 hills. So then divide the number of hills at the fertilizer needed by the um, number of hills. So we have 13.7 grams per hill. Okay. Next is organic fertilizer. So na-discuss na natin ko kanina. So any product in solid or liquid form of plant or animal organ that has undergone substantial decomposition that can supply available nutrients of plants with a total of N, P, and K to 5 to 7%. Uh, this is before pa, 2013 time 5 to 7. I think then is 5 to 12% na. This may be enriched by microbial inoculants and naturally occurring materials, minerals, but no chemical or inorganic fertilizer materials has been added and to finish product for effect of nutrient content. So composting, it is the process of allowing organic materials to decompose under more or less controlled conditions to produce an end product that can be used as fertilizer, such as foul odor, presence of pathogens, and other undesirable physical properties are removed or abated. So benefits ng paggamit natin ng organic matter. So paggamit natin ng organic matter has physical benefit physical benefits has benefits on the physical properties of our soil, chemical properties and biological properties. For the physical properties, it enhances soil aggregation and aggregate stability. It enhances it increases water retention and aeration, darken the soil meaning sa color sa color naman siya and then it reduces bulk density and compaction so kapag mababang bulk density mataas ang porosity for chemical it increases soil cec increases nutrient availability it increases soil's native supply of n p and s and inactivates toxins and pesticides for biological it provides c and energy to soil microorganisms that increases their density and activity and enhances microbial functions so I think that's the end of my presentation. But now, meron lang akong mga ilang um, dito, sample questions para for you to, to practice. So the first one, the predominant available form of N under flooded soil condition. So pwede nyo pong i-chat yun yung sagot. A, NO3N, B, organic N, C, NH4N, D, NO2N, or E, NH2N. Ano kayang predominant na available ng nitrogen under flooded condition. Anyone? May chat ba? <laughs> okay, so there is answer, there's a C. May nagsagot ng C. C, okay. So, correct answer here is C, NH4N, because in under flooded condition, wala masyadong oxygen. So, um, NO3 is predominant under upland condition, and NH4 is uh, <clears throat> predominant under lowland or flooded condition. Okay, next one. The highest analysis grade solid and fertilizer. Ammonium sulfate, anhydrous ammonia, urea, or ammonium nitrate. So we have B, C, B, solid. Okay. So for this one, the answer is also, the answer is C. So anhydrous ammonia siya yung may pinakamataas na analysis na and fertilizer, but it is not solid. So urea is the answer. Next one, the, the other essential nutrient present in ammonium sulfate but absent in urea. So meron sa ammonium sulfate pero wala sa urea. Ano yun? Okay, so we have B sulfur. So, um, pero yung ammonium sulfate is still classified as single element fertilizer. <laughs> Sorry, ngayon ko lang nabasa yung kaninang kaninang ano, <laughs> kaninang comment na medyo mabilis. Sorry po, medyo mabilis pala. Kasi ay, meron lang konting oras eh, kaya binibilis ako na para ma-cover lahat. Okay, sorry po. 
pero I think this is recorded yata sa Google sa ano sa Facebook so you can go back para medyo baganan yung discussion. Sorry po for that. The next one, the the present np 5 and K2O in a fertilizer. So ano yung tawag natin doon? So that is fertilizer again. Next one, a single element or straight fertilizer. So alin dito sa mga to ang straight fertilizer or single element? Complete fertilizer, ammonium phosphate, urea, or all of the above. Alin po yung single element? Single element, of course, yung isa lang, we have urea. Okay, kasi complete fertilizer, kompleto nga siya. So it is, a it is complete fertilizer. Among yung phosphate, dalawa. So that is a compound fertilizer or double element ng fertilizer. So urea is only, con only contain nitrogen. So yun lang yung single element fertilizer. Dark. Next, the fertilizer nutrients. that are generally applied all at planting time. NP, PK, NK, or P and CA. A, NNP, A, NNP, B, P and K. Um, actually, um, ang laging yung tatandaan is, syempre, ang ina-apply lang naman as fertilizer is NP and K. So yun si yung may CA, hanggal na siya. And nitrogen, mabilis siyang mawala sa lupa, so dapat hindi siya ina-applied all at planting time. So we have P and K. So yun yung isang way para mas makapag makakuha natin yung tamang sagot. Kahit hindi natin alam talaga yung tamang sagot, we can look at the choices. Ano, pwede tayo mag-eliminate. Power of elimination sa choices natin. So doon, and P, K lang may na-apply. So we cannot... Pwede hindi na natin isama yung calcium. So yung choice sa may calcium, tanggal na natin. And then, among the three fertilizers, among the three nutrients, ang mabilis mawala, kaya ini-split apply this nitrogen. So any choice sa may nitrogen, tanggal. So natitira na lang is CPNK. Okay? So you can use that technique kapag nagsasagot na kayo sa isang board exam. Next, the fertilizer nutrients, which are usually split applied. Ayan, nasabi ko kanina. So we have NNK. So pwede rin silang split applied. Okay. Next one. The available form of nitrogen, N2, N2O, NH4, and NO3, NH3. E. Okay. Available form of nitrogen. Na lagay na natin kanina, ionic form. Available form dapat. So we have NH, I'm sorry, NH4 plus and NO3 minus. Ammonium and um, nitrate. Next, yung deficiency, deficiency ng sulfur first shows up as chlorosis off. Okay, in young leaves. Kasi um, sulfur are immobile elements. So older or young lang naman yung ano natin dyan, yung pangimilian natin. Okay. Next one, the suitable fertilizer for an alkaline and deficient soil. So alkaline, masabi ko na ito kanina, so medyo mataas yung pH. So kapag kulang sa nitrogen, syempre, nitrogenous fertilizer. Sa lahat naman ito ay nitrogenous fertilizer. So alin lang yung merong um, applicable kapag and deficient, ay kapag um, alkaline. So See? pag alkaline, Alkaline na yung mataas ng calcium niya, so we must not apply more calcium. So we must apply ammonium sulfate ano, para mabalance, para medyo mababa, bumaba yung pH. So we need to add also sulfur. So ammonium sulfate yung needed. Okay? Next one, the appropriate end fertilizer for sulfur deficit also the same. So may nitrogen at saka may sulfur sa ammonium sulfate. Okay? Next, application of fertilizer at planting. So, anong tawag dun sa pag-apply natin ng fertilizer during planting time? Okay, timing of application dapat to. So, yung foliar at band, hindi siya timing kasi kung saan siya i-apply. So, we have top dressing and basal. So, alin lang ba yung pag-top dressing, may tanim na. Eh, at planting, so magtatanim pa lang. So, we have basal. Okay, good. 
Next, application of fertilizer after plant emergence. So basal, top dressing, foliar, and deplacement. Top dressing. Okay, so that is top dressing. Good. Very good, Ma'am Eloran. Eloran, tama ba? Next, when nutrients are mobile in plant, deficiency symptoms show first at kapag mobile, saan una nakikita? Oldest leaves, youngest leaves, or intermediate leaves? Okay, so we have, the answer here is the oldest leaves, of course. Oldest or youngest lang naman siya, no? So kapag mobile, oldest, pag mobile, youngest. I think this is the last question for na kaya kong i-share. So the nutrient antagonism means reduce availability or absorption of a nutrient. So anong ibig sabihin nun? When another nutrient is deficient, when another nutrient is excessive, or when another nutrient present in equal amount. So ano bang ibig sabihin ng nutrient antagonism? Nagiging, nare-reduce yung availability ng, or absorption of a particular element kapag Okay, so I think marami na katama when, when another nutrient is excessive. So kahit na, mara, kahit na nasa tamang amount naman yung isang element, pero yung another element is excessive, yung nasa tamang amount lang, hindi siya masyado nagiging available, hindi siya masyado na-absorb kasi sobra-sobra yung isa. Okay, so yun, that is how nutrient antagonism occur. So these are the references for this lecture and yun lang. God bless po. Ayan. So, any questions po or clarification with regards to the lecture na na-share? Um, sorry, medyo naman pasok ko sa oras. Kala ang alam ko kasi one hour lang yung bibigay but um, pinili naman natin makapasok <laughs> sa oras. Okay. Pasensya po if medyo mabilis. Thank you po sir sa yung time. Thank you po sa pagbigay ng uh, knowledge about soil. Thank you po. And kung may katanungan tayo kay sir, ngayon na ang pagkakataon para ating itanong. Sir, may tanong po pala na eh, remember ko. Uh, may nalilito kasi. Ang sabi niya po ay sa ibang review centers, 18 daw ang essential elements. So, para clarify po daw kung ilan ba talaga. Okay, so actually essential. ako, ano din, nalilito din ako doon kasi there are references na 18, there are references na 17. Pero actually doon niya sa iba may 19 pa kasi dinagdag na yung silicon, dinagdag na yung V. Nakamata ko yung V na added. But... Um, to be sure, mas okay na kunin natin yung um, before na literature kasi I think yung sa sa PRC mas meron na silang mga nakaembang na questions ano at yung mga dating um, dating literature yung kanilang nako consider yan pero sa ano naman sa mga review materials wala pa naman akong nakikita na tinanong kung ilan yung essential. Siguro mga questions ng kadalasan, which among the nutrients yung essential. Ayan. Kasi nga, iba-iba talaga siya. Um, actually, nung nagagawa kami ng review material for um, for soil science, alin ba talagang susundin natin? Kasi nagka nagkakaiba nga sa iba't ibang um, literature. Ayan. So, siguro if... Um, matatapos yung review material na binubuo namin kasi yung lahat ng state U na nagtuturo ng soils, nagtuturo din ng crop science actually sa iba't ibang field naman nagkikreate ngayon ng merong um, dito, merong effort ang ACAP yung lahat ng state university na nag-offer na agriculture para makapag release nga ng review material so malapit na malapit na siyang matapos kasi nire-review pa actually last year pa namin yung pisan so yun siguro yung mas okay natin na reviewin para um, yun din kasi yung ibibigay sa PRC na um, na, na pattern ng mga pinag-aralan talaga sa agriculture sa different field para doon nila masusunod yung yung questions na nabubuoin nila yun po Thank you po, sir. Ayan, kung may katanungan pa tayo ay itanong na natin, di ba? Sayang ang pagkakataon. <laughs> And if kung wala na, 
Ayun. Chat nyo lang po kami kung meron po kayong mga late questions. Mamayang gabi may iisip nyo. At itatanong na lang namin kay sir. Then, uh, okay lang po ba yun, sir? Then, okay po. Okay lang. Naman na, namin po yung sagot. Sige po. Wala na. Magkaroon po muna ulit daw tayo ng picture taking. Sabi ni Sir Brian. Request by Sir Brian. And Sir Brian. Ayan. Wait lang po. Bob, give picture na po ulit ako. Teka. One, two, three. Isa pa po. One, two, three. Ayan, okay na po. Thank ano you po. po. Uh, award na po ng certificate. Thank you po. Apo. Ayan. Maraming salamat po. And evaluation form po. Evaluation form. Wait lang po. Uh, for that, we will award the certificate of appreciation, of course, to Sir Salvo Salvacion. In recognition of his outstanding contribution as volunteer for sharing knowledge during Padayan Hiraya Manawari Free Leia Review Sessions on April 3, 2022, signed by Renstrika Dukoy, signed by Felix S. Valdez, organizers, and signed by Brian Angelo Sustrina, head organizer. Thank you po ulit, sir, at God bless you po. Ayun. Thank you rin po, and I would like to commend everyone para sa pag um, buo ng ganitong event. Malaking tulong po to para sa ating mga future agricultures. Thank you po. Thank you po. Thank you po. And then, of course, our different partner organizations. Thank you po sa inyong pag-support and hopefully matapos natin ito ng buo. Sorry. Okay. Again, see you next week. So for our evaluation, nasan na ba ang evaluation form, Sir Brian? Follow na lang po. <laughs> oh, follow na lang, yes. Uh, we will share it to the, our group, yung ating evaluation form. And uh, good luck, future agriculture. So, so, magandang hapon po. Sa yes po, ano po yun? Hello po. Andiyan pa po ba kayo? Yun. I think if no more, we can leave the, uh, the Zoom na po. Ay, question ko lang po. Yes po, ma'am. Ano po yun, um, ma'am? Meron po bang isisend na saan po ba natin ma-review yung record nito, itong session na po today? Mm, makikita po natin iyon sa YouTube. Tama po ba, Sir Brian? Meron po sa Facebook page. Meron din sa YouTube. Ah, nasa page. Yes po. Ayan. Okay. Thank you po. Thank you. Welcome po. Sumuli. Good afternoon. And paalam po sa tila. Okay po. And gano po ito. <laughs> Salamat po. <laughs>